there's a story of him, you know, the, the ship was midnight, dead in the water, no lights, trying to recover aircraft, and he got a handheld radio and then got a bunch of tugs to turn their headlights on in the L.A. to create some kind of light to help these guys land. Just legendary stories that just don't really compute in uh, today's era. Right. keep going <laughs> all right well hello and welcome to the fighter pilot podcast i am your host vincent aiello call sign jello i can't remember much else but we're already having a good time because we're talking landing signal officers and joining me today is joe kirksey call sign jamboy how you doing jamboy jello i'm happy to be here it's awesome <laughs> been a big time listener for a while so it's oh, been good. a good day well we're having fun already and i know this will be good <laughs> Uh, gosh, what did I forget to say? Let's see. Uh, we're in the Circle Air Group Studios here at Glesby Field. You know why, by the way, I have to say that all the time? Because the guy who owns this, Bones, who was sitting in that chair, yeah. he gives me a break on the rent. If you got to keep him uh, happy. Advertising. So, yeah. People helping people, Absolutely. right? That's right. <laughs> so, anyhow, cool. Well, Jamboy, I have been, first off, thank you for being here. Absolutely. You're a pain in my butt. Because <laughs> I've been, you're not the only one. I've been working on you. <laughs> you're a pain in their butt? Yeah, that's correct. Okay, the good. list is long. Yeah, all right. But distinguish yeah. anyway there you go. uh about. no we've been we've been trying to uh, get this for a while we're supposed to have someone in that chair with you but i think you're going to be able to hold court on your own i feel like i think so and you know he's not as handsome so it'll just kind of ruin the effect anyways. yeah true well neither one of them we had a couple guys there so yeah, true, true. shout out to groot who i guess was going to join us but then yep. uh per his namesake i think kissed a tree while he was snowboarding tree won the battle tree Shocker. won yeah and then <laughs> tip got caught up in some mother may i i guess so. he's a big bad department head now so you got to make sure right. he's uh, He's probably making the boss happy in some okay. fashion, right? Well, we'll we'll carry on without <laughs> you. Uh, and we're going to talk LSOs. What does LSO stand for? Uh, yeah, landing signal officer is the official term okay. according to the Navy. And what is a landing signal officer? High level, because we're going to get into a yeah, bunch of beeps and squeaks. Uh, we are the, uh, the legends that stand on the back of the ship, and we basically – help aircraft all variants whether it's rhino growler f-35 or hawkeye and we assist them in the landing process all the way from the 180 until they're in the wire safely okay now here on the fighter pilot podcast we have had episodes way back when on aircraft carriers i think part one and two yeah. day carrier landings part one and two night landings uh with fish and then later we came back and did i think a day carrier landing part three because we had a gentleman who landed on straight deck carriers by the way legend and so yeah for sure absolutely so we're going to talk about all that but let's get to know you first so where are you from where'd you go to school what got you excited in military aviation in the first place and and what have you done up till now yeah absolutely i'll try to keep it short and sweet uh native of thousand oaks california okay. kind of just south of ventura mm -hmm. point magoo area calabasas yep uh very famous for the kardashians as everyone knows calabasas well, also is. where um um, basketball player met his fate. Unfortunately, I... yeah. Uh, so, grew, uh, born and raised there. Uh, graduated Thousands High School from there. Uh, was a horrible high school student, so didn't have a lot of college options. So, I went to a junior college after that, uh, the local one there, and then transferred to Amber Riddle down here in San Diego. Got my bachelor's uh, and then OCS. Uh, and then out of there, out of OCS, straight into flight school, basically, standard route, about two and a half years. Uh, selected Super Hornets by, you know, whoever decided that decision uh, was great, though. And then uh, 122 as a student, and then I was a Warhawk J.O. flying the Super Hornet. Uh, back to 122 as an FRS instructor for two years. I uh, did the TAC demo there and flew the oh. probably the most important plane in the naval inventory, the T-34, turbo <laughs> dog, as we call it. <laughs> Beautiful aircraft. Uh, CAG-9 paddles, and now I'm force paddles down working here in Coronado okay. at CNAF, or Commander of Naval Air Forces, for the Airbus. Do you guys have a boss yet? Are we still We do. In We're in a weird uh, inner, like in between stage yeah. as Congress decides if they even want to pay us after October 1st. So oh, we'll that's right. see what happens. Well, first we have the guy who's upset about things, which, okay, you know, let's not get into that. Uh, and we're recording this towards the end of September, so by the time people see it, maybe all this is resolved. Yeah, but then we have the budget matter. standby off or uh, standoff. So anyway, Just let's stick with more it. exciting things like LSS. So. Yeah. Okay. Cool. So uh, did you like? Did you have any uncles, dads, or anyone who was into it? Uh, Honestly, no. I was the uh, first one in the family to become an officer in the military. My dad just took me to air shows. Uh -huh. You know, me and him. Point Magoo. Yeah, Point Magoo and Miramar, and we just did Miramar last weekend. We haven't been together in a while, so. Did that for a while, and then I started flying when I was 15 up in Camarillo, um, kind of non-traditional. Got my pilot's license high school, and then I was a line service kid through high school and college just driving fuel trucks. 
finding any way to make a dollar to fly airplanes. There you go. Uh, and then got inspired that way and, you know, decided to turn it on and realized OCS was a was an option and you didn't have to go to the Naval Academy or something to go be a pilot. Uh, once I learned that through my great mentor, Mother Hubbard, uh, he kind of helped me out tremendously and uh, had my best friends in TO guiding me as well. Uh, and then, yeah. Okay. So the rest is history. Yeah, as they right, say. As they say. All right. So uh, just, I just did this with Tucker from 101 sure. on episode 177 the other day. He also had some flight experience when he went to flight school. Yeah. What was your experience? Did it help you? Oh, gosh. I get this question a lot. I probably had like 500, 600 hours oh, wow. a multi-commercial instrument before I joined the Navy. Um, it definitely helps in those early stages, right? You know, primary where, you know, talking on the radio is comfortable and just right. general understanding of landing patterns and kind of how to get the plane there. But it all evens out as you kind of get into, you know, advance. You know, if you select jets as you get in advance, and then it's pretty much even playing field as you get into the FRS. But the initial phases mm -hmm. uh, definitely helps. As long as you are smart about it, you don't, you know, you stay humble and stay quiet about it. Because I've seen the opposite of ATP hey. guys. Like, yeah, I flew a CRJ <laughs> SkyWest 3,000 hour, and then they fail out of flight school. So uh, don't be that guy, yeah. I would say, to the young listeners that want to do this one day probably. Yeah. Yeah, well, 3,000 <laughs> hours in an airliner is like 3,000 hours in front of your computer. I mean, you're clicking buttons <laughs> right. and turning knobs, uh, yeah. not to marginalize it, yeah. but it's uh, very you hope that nothing ever exciting happens. <laughs> yeah. So, okay, cool. Uh, gosh, man, I don't know where to start. So um, let's see. Okay, so we talked about your background and all that. And you told us what an LSO is. Let's get in the Wayback Machine and, and go back to the beginning. I mean, really all the way to the beginning, right? 1903, uh, Orville and Wilbur are figuring out the powered yeah. fixed wing. Uh, everybody was kind of trying for a while there. And that was what, 1903? Correct. I want to say it was Ely, I think is, is pronounced. Uh, mm -hmm. The first landing on a ship was only like eight years later. Yeah, pretty 1911. So Yeah, straight deck uh, ropes and sandbags to stop it. And he figured it out there in a bay somewhere. Uh, but the LSOs themselves, I actually had to do a little digging. Uh, okay. And... Uh, for a while, through those first probably like 20 years of naval aviation, you know, as we're landing airplanes on boats, uh, LSOs didn't exist. There's a lot of wive tales sitting out there of where they came from. And the best one that I could find was there was a skipper of a squadron with the Langley, early 1920s, who was actually standing on the, you know, left left side of the ship i don't know what is that port side I'm not very good with the ship terms <laughs> Come on. it's a boat i should call it a boat as well That's right, yeah. the port side of the ship basically where we stand now kind of that aft port side mm -hmm. and he was just making high low comets uh for his nuggets essentially back then hmm. and as the langley pushed on uh some kind of deployment or workup 1925 he selected two jos to basically stand out there with paddles which i'll uh, i'm sure we'll look at these actual paddles is where the old school term paddles comes from and they only had three comments. It was high, you're too high, you're too low, or you're okay. Uh, so it was high, you're on, or you're low. Uh, these guys would just stand there and do that. And since then, uh, you know, as we developed into, you know, well into World War II, paddles have been standing on the back of boats watching every single arrested landing we do underway mm -hmm. since then. So it was pretty incredible. Almost 100 years of, of paddling, if you will. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah. So that's why an LSO is nicknamed Paddles that's because, correct. in fact, we've got some multimedia today. Let's go to the first picture. Uh, I don't even know what kind of airplane this is. Maybe I should. It looks like a... You got that. Is that a... I got it. I'm also an airplane nerd. Though. Are you? It's a... Prop plane? It's a prop plane, yeah. All Looks right. like an Avenger to me. Okay. Looks like an old torpedo bomber. People are throwing things right yeah. now at the, at the, at the radio and the I got your back. Jello, come I got on, man. Back. All right, so this is one of those guys that is literally standing out there with yeah. some paddles. And uh, go to the next picture for us, Kevin. And uh, so, I mean, that's not what Look you're going to see from the airplane's perspective. But I guess, I mean, right today, and we'll get to some of the different casualties that we could have if, sure. if I was trying to land in my F-18 and you were waving me. But, like, what these guys are coming aboard so much slower, I guess they can theoretically see this. Duh. Correct. Yeah. Correct. I just want to compliment that this guy's waving in khakis with a K bar as well. Which oh, is, wow. I'm, I mean, I'm a, I got a boat dead in October. I might dress up like this for the first day because that's a pretty <laughs> tough old school picture. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, back then, uh, the you know, during the daytime, it was just guys standing out there. Usually, each boat usually only had one LSO in kind of the 40s through the 60s. It was mm -hmm. kind of the go-to guy. It's not like we do it now, which I'm sure we're going to talk about. Uh, and he was out there just visual landing pattern. And if you look at the numbers of kind of the case one stack back then, especially World War II, it was like 60 feet at the 90, and then you would pick them up through the 45, and then you can't really see them over the nose. Aircraft like the Corsair and stuff like that. That's wow. why they struggled getting aboard. Um, they developed 
you know, multitude of more hand signals back then. The LSO school used to have a T-shirt that had like 30 stick figures with all different signals, which was kind of cool. Uh, we don't train to that now, by the way, but it was just cool heritage. Uh, you know, high, low, right rudder, and then basically until your straight deck boat for sure back then. Uh, until you kind of get the cut signal, which was just idle and set the hook, right. uh, which we definitely don't do now. But <laughs> some of us, some do. of us do, and then usually I'm yelling at them or <laughs> telling them to go around or stitching them up. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but that was it. And then it even got into you know as we kind of teasing with the night carrier landing thing, 4050s. I'm not kidding. It's Chris. It was almost like Christmas lights on a suit. Uh, so the LSO wore this light up suit, and you know as you go through this LSO school, there's kind of stories. You, and you talk to some of the old timers. These things had some casualty rates, too, where they would just, you know, catch on fire. <laughs> some horrible Randomly? things, right? Yeah, could you imagine? Because it's got lights on it. It's got lights on it. It's not very vetted. It's probably got stitched together in a state room, I would assume. Oh, my goodness. But they would stand out there with the same thing, just lights on a suit and trying to guide, guide the boys home. That was what I wanted to ask you next, because obviously this photograph is all fine and good in the daytime. Yeah. The sun goes down or the weather goes down, and now we need to be able to see to land at night. But to be fair, these days – correct me if I'm wrong, pretty much everybody flies day and night. Correct. In those days, you had some specialty correct. folks that went at yeah, night. Yeah, it was more senior members were doing mm -hmm. the night stuff, and the night sorting even, counts were... Yeah, or even certain nothing. squadrons. Correct. Like a night yeah. fighter uh, Yeah, squadron. night yeah. fighter attack squadron, yeah. absolutely. Okay. Uh, but now everybody's, do, you know, okay. we're all doing the same. So there was these, like you said, different hand signals, but didn't a, did a foot come in at some point as well? Like, it was, is it, was that for the rudder, maybe? Yeah, that was for the rudder. Okay. Yeah, literally kicking a boot of rudder uh, from the LSO, right uh, rudder, left rudder. Yeah, okay. it's just incredible that they could even see that. Yeah. Uh, my Hawkeye LSOs always are telling me I need to make more right rudder calls. I'm like, oh, he looks, he's on glide slope. <laughs> Come on. Hawkeye, Hawkeye moves a thousand times on glide slope. Yeah, that's If I true. get the general idea, we'll be all right. Okay. But, yeah. All right. So at some point, right, jets start appearing at the ship. They're Absolutely. coming aboard a lot faster. Mm -hmm. uh, the the angled deck comes along, so we're not just cutting into the wires anymore. <laughs> or uh, throwing them into the barricade if it didn't work out. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah. That's right. And we did. We had an episode on the straight deck. Gosh, that gentleman, Hold apparently on. he's still around, Dale Bourbon, oh, uh, in his mid-90s, uh, helps out on the Hornet that's up in so the Bay Area. Cool. Yeah. Isn't that great? Um, all right, so uh, I mean, you brought some paddles in. Uh, what is there anything? What's to look at here? I did. I wish I had more of a history. I could probably make up a history of these. Uh, <laughs> I found these in the CNAP building. We have kind of a little museum up there. And uh -huh. I was like, oh, there's no way. Uh, so yeah, that's kind of oh, what it's they like look gold like. Gold on one side and like gold, purple on the other. Yeah, I don't know that. I wish I had more knowledge on what the colors meant. But you can see, you know, they're made to blow in the wind and mm -hmm. stuff like that. So you're not holding a tennis, you know, a piece of plywood in the wind. Yeah, your arms would probably get pretty burned out. Yeah. <clears throat> but, all right. Yeah, just cool heritage of. And that's really where, you know, people ask us all the time, why are you called paddles? That's your answer. There you go. Yeah. Okay. Now, keep the uh, history going up to the modern day. I don't know how much there is in the middle. Sure. I know where we are today, sort of. Yeah. Um, but uh, what, what what was in the middle? And over to you as much as you do or don't want to talk about yeah. the, right? It used to be visual, look at a guy with paddles. Yep. Then lenses came along. We've had some discussion on this show about that. So as yeah. much as you want. Yeah, I'll try to keep it as brief as possible. Uh, just like you said, faster jets, faster approach speeds, modernizations in naval aviation. Uh, the first one was the mirror lens, which was just a giant kind of six foot tall mirror. But they all have the general same idea. Uh, if you're trying to, you have a horizon line of lights, which we call the datums, that's never changed. Uh, and then you have the ball or the meatball, you know, when we say Roger ball. And if that ball is on the center of those datums, that landing source, however it's set to, whatever glide slope it's set to and whatever target wire it's set to by the LSO, is going to guide the hook point of the aircraft to that spot on the flight deck. Those have all improved, mirror lenses, flosses, eye flosses. And then now uh, we're starting to transition into even a new update to the current lens. Same exact construct, just improving the lights with more LED t uh, style type lights uh, as, you know, Con I'm sure these lenses were built in the 80s. Parts are running out. They get broken pretty quickly. Let's try mm -hmm. to improve it uh, yeah. on our Nimitz class boats and then into Ford. Okay. So this is what we had up until, I don't know, probably upper 40s, maybe 50s. Yep. Uh, Kevin, go to the next one for us. This is what it sort of looks like today. I don't know, you can tell me otherwise. but um, And we have listener questions coming up, and one of them will be about the number of people out there. Yeah, but but uh, tell us, I mean, if you're going out in October, presumably to join somebody on a boat debt, yep. you know, you're going to be something similar to this. I mean, give us a rough overview of, of what we have today. Yeah, absolutely. So. Uh, we kind of transitioned away from, like I said, just the one LSO type mindset. Mm -hmm. um, the last one is our is our Lord and Savior, Bug Roach, was kind of the guy, the last single LSO. And we transitioned more to a team mindset, let's call that early, early 90s or so. 
Uh, what that allows us to do, uh, you'll see on future slides, but it, we kind of have a pretty uh, semi-complex system, but you'll basically have a controlling LSO, we'll call them primary. You can see that one's usually standing on the far left of the lineup there. Okay. Uh, so the guy holding the handset in the pickle, that's usually your primary LSO. Somewhat of a uh, moderately trained, you know, kind of middle tour JO or LSO has been doing it for a little while. And they're just strictly controlling glide slope. And when I say controlling, it's all eyeball cow. There's no screen. There's no imaginary line out there. He's seen, you know, the senior LSO or the CAG paddles is entrusting him. He's seen enough passes to where he has a good eyeball cow, as we call it. Mm -hmm. And he can tell, devi you know, deviations high or low in glide slope. Next to that is usually on your team, the, uh, the, besides CAG Paddles, who's going to be the most senior LSO, is going to be, that's your backup LSO now. Um, so is this picture is, if we had better multimedia, I sure. would be able to have like an arrow or something. But yeah. in this picture we're looking at, is it the guy whose head is the tallest? Yeah, exactly. Okay. So kind of guy on the handset there to yep. your right, that's going to be your backup LSO. So he's usually the most senior or training to be senior LSO of that wave team, which mm -hmm. I'll talk to you. Okay. Um, and he is helping the CAG paddles to ensure that not only is glide slope, he's backing up primary, but he's also really hawking lineup. And we just use the traditional L, uh, plat cam from the LSODs for lineup as long as we get a good lineup check before we go out. Uh, we'll just use a center line on that to help control lineup. But now he's, you know, he's kind of thinking waving more advanced, making every aircraft has a certain wind over the deck requirement based off density, altitude, and type of aircraft. Then from there, we have to set the arresting gear to a specific weight for every type of aircraft. You know, normal situation, we have canned weights for each jet. In emergencies, we'll have to actually set the gear to within 1,000 pounds to a certain gear. Uh, and then overall, trying to manage and control and teach his team. Mm. And then myself or any CAG paddles or force paddles, we stand to the far right now. Uh, and we're just the senior LSO on the platform overall in charge of everything. And what's interesting with the comms there, you know, we have a handset sitting right here. Mm -hmm. um, not pictured in this one, but the, uh, the CAG LSO will wear a headset so we can kind of keep working around. But there's a waterfall effect with the comms. So if primary is making a call, whether I agree with it or don't agree with it, or if he doesn't make it soon enough, the CAG LSO, their mic will trump all the other communications uh, okay. on the platform. Mm -hmm. uh, so we, that's part of our pre-checks <clears throat> as we kind of get out there each time. And then same thing. So it's just a waterfall effect from right to left in terms of seniority with the mm -hmm. comms. So okay. you can ensure the senior guy can always make a call Yeah, if that needs right. to happen. So in this photo, again, the guy second from left is holding his wristwatch. What's, yeah. what's he doing? <laughs> so now uh, we kind of talk about other roles of the team. The guy mm -hmm. holding his watch there during day recoveries, we're really hard on ourselves on two things. One of them being interval. And when I say that, the amount of time there's an open deck, whether it's you're the first aircraft coming down or really where it comes into effect is jet to jet as they're in the pattern the general number is about 55 to 65 seconds we want to manage in between traps we don't really want more than that because uh, in a tactical scenario when you're waving on cruise we always got to point the ship in the wind and maybe that's not the best direction for the ship to mm -hmm. go so if the air wing can help the ship out you know team mentality of minimizing that downrange travel with the boat we always try to improve and be yeah. hard on ourselves from that so he's timing that, and then he's also timing groove length for a day case one pattern where we're doing an approach turn, mm. which we target 15 to 18 seconds for a groove length every single time. Anything outside of that, you know, you're going to get a comment or it'll, it could affect the grading of your pass if it's too short or too long and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And then as you kind of look around, the guy to the right of him holding the book, there's always a rider there. He's going to be writing down the grade. Uh, first things first, who's it? You know, which jet is it? Side number? grade and wire we owe that to the pilot landing every single time to make sure hey were you in this jet yes is this the wire you caught yes <laughs> here's your grade mm -hmm. uh and then also the lso shorthand uh which is basically a very convoluted egyptian style alien style writing that we learn <laughs> uh to basically describe what happened in the past with you know high low left right and the yeah. calls that we made so that we're when we're debriefing the pilot they can learn something from it. They know where to improve or they know where they made a mistake. Yeah. Uh, and that's kind of your general team. That's like the minimum you really need from there. And, and then you might have other people coming up because they want to be paddles or they correct. used to be and they just want to watch yep. or just strap hangers or whatever. People just want to be out there. But yeah. what's so if it's, you know, super late at night, they launch the alert and now we just need to recover that one or two uh, alert flight. What's the minimum number of 
folks we need up there? Yeah, Min Manning, uh, two LSOs essentially. Okay. So, and that's what we would like to have. Um, the and what that allows you to do is mainly make sure that we can manage the wave off windows if the deck is foul. Uh, but at a minimum, hopefully CAG paddles is up there, or you're getting the dreaded sitting at mid rats CAG paddles to the platform call <laughs> across the one MC on the ship, and right. then everyone's yelling at you as you're trying to and making fun of you as you're trying to run up to the platform. <laughs> uh, but yeah, that's kind of our mid Manny. Gotcha. There. All right, well, so there's a lot to unpack in all that, and that's yeah, what we're going to spend some time doing today. Uh, but you threw out the name Bug Roach, so I, I know who he is, sort yeah. of. Um, I think, so he ended up passing right about the time I was coming in. Um, but tell me quickly who he is and, and why he was such a big deal. And, and, and I'm trying to get to something. If you don't get what I'm going sure. with it, I'll, I'll bring it up. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Bug Roach, I mean, he's kind of just the legend fighter pilot LSO that we all idolize to be, I would mm -hmm. say, especially in the paddles community. Uh, rough ballpark, kind of served our nation 70s through the 80s phase. You know, and you look at his stats. If, if anyone listening, just Google Bug Roach, and there's usually a write-up. There's two things or you're going to get. Or YouTube it. Or YouTube it, yeah. You'll get some of his talk downs. You'll get a bio on him and see kind of his stats. I mean, it was like five CAG paddles deployments, you know, the most barricades of everybody. There's a story of him, you know, the, the ship was midnight, dead in the water, no lights, trying to recover aircraft, and he got a handheld radio and then got a bunch of tugs to turn their headlights on in the L.A. to create some kind of light to help these guys land. Just legendary stories that just don't really compute in uh, today's era. Right. Uh, and then apparently, you know, it's just the personality of the air wing. Uh, yeah. And to the point where there's the annual tailhook convention, the, bug Ro the LSO of the Year Award is the Bug Roach LSO. The big cocktail mixer we do on Friday is the Bug Roach cocktail mixer. So you can tell he, you know, yeah. never met him. I was yeah. one year, I was I was a year old when he passed away. Oh, wow. So yeah. there's a little age pop for you. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, so you can tell he had an effect on naval aviation. Yeah. S speaking of him, you want a beer? <sighs> Direct key to my heart, Jello. All right. I almost asked you earlier if this was going to be a beer uh, event. Uh, <laughs> it's not normally, but it is. It is going to be this time. You know, it's not. Do you it's wanna, not a paddle. Which talk. one of these do you want? Oh, it doesn't matter. They're all take, the take same. Take one, except I dropped one of those. So oh, be careful. Oh, it's probably this it. one then. Kevin, you want a beer? With my luck. Absolutely. All right, I'll just throw it over to you. We're going to keep rolling. Now we're right. talking paddles. Now we're talking. We all got right. hops Oh, flowing. look at this. I even have a uh, koozie for you. Well, you know, I wouldn't be a true pals if I didn't bring my own Oh, my goodness. Look at you. I go. Well, then I'll throw it over to Kevin. Yeah. <laughs> well, now so. We're, okay, now we're in the business. Now we're in here, business. Boy. Yep. So the other thing about Bug Roach, though, was, as I understand it, is he was he was great at calming people down right mm -hmm. one of the things the lso does not just the safe and expeditious recovery of aircraft i think i read somewhere i was not an lso <laughs> but but at least and we'll talk about plm i have not tried it uh, but that's one of the big reasons i wanted to bring you in yeah but in the old days it used to be really scary i mean especially Absolutely. at night and when he came on the radio evidently like if i was up there and i was tense <sighs> oh it's bug Bug, he's gonna bring me home, on the other right? Side. You know, yeah. And isn't that still part of the responsibility of an LSO these days? Absolutely. Noise. Um, cheers, by the way. Thank let's, you. Let's be gentlemen about this. I would say bull moose, but it's okay. For the <laughs> those for who know, boys. they know. Those who know, they know. That's right. Uh, yeah, you know it is. The, besides, uh, just the, the the waving thing, which we're gonna get into the LSO and kind of all the training you do into that. One of the big things of the, our community that we really pride ourselves on, and we, you know, we try to pick guys that have similar personalities as we go through this, we consider ourselves the morale officers of the air wing, especially when you're on that month eight of cruise on your second extension. Um, sometimes a little shenanigans or having a beer you know, off the ship or out in a port call with one of the young guys, it goes such a far way, um, and it, it can really just turn the tide of – the morale of an entire air wing, you know, mm -hmm. down in the dumps, missing home and paddles will always find creative ways. That can be episode two of this. If you need, it. I got about three <laughs> hours of paddles, and shenanigans stories. So I'll try to keep it PG just in case mom's listening. Uh, but that's a huge, that's a huge thing. And I think once you build that relationship with your air wing and you can obviously prove that you're pretty good in the jet as well. And you take landing on the boat seriously, but then you take tactics and things seriously as well. Not only are you kind of inspiring the guys underneath you, which is always huge in our in naval aviation is mm -hmm. mentorship and leadership and stuff like that. But you'll have, you know, the same thing. It's like, all right, I know Jamboy is good. Not only does he know his stuff, but, you know, 
I had a couple beers with them and we talked some good stories and I try and I trust them. Mm -hmm. You know, you got to build that trust and that goes more than just doing your job. Yeah. You know, you got to kind of go above and beyond. And that's probably what made Bug. I'm sure Bug was a legend for that. Yeah. Well, he seems to be everything I've ever heard or yeah. read. I've been thinking about trying to figure out how we could do an episode about him. I need to find someone who's maybe doing <laughs> his biography or something. But yeah, um, yeah, and, and that's the thing. So I was, you know, we'll get to it at different parts of this. And I think long term, long time listeners of the show have heard me say it. I was very blue collar uh, on the ball, <laughs> but also you I gotta love those guys though too. Yeah, <laughs> you're, well, hey, you're working I, harder. I, than yeah, I keep else. you guys uh, busy. <laughs> But also, I remember, we'll get to who becomes one uh, here in a second, but I remember thinking, I respect those guys so much, I don't know that I see myself as one. Because you really, like you said, you're not only very competent, but you're comforting, right? So you're, right. you're out there, you're, you're in command, you're taking charge, and uh, not everybody gets to do it. But right. um, no, it, it's, it's an amazing thing. And I feel like the people that become LSOs or even more, it's almost like Top Gun. I mean, that's what I did instead. But it's almost like a Top Gun instructor. It's like you're sort of rising at the top of the cream of a different kind of bottle because sure. people like you, they know you, you know the equipment, you know the uh, all the different things you need to know for landing. And not just the landing gear itself, but ship operations, right? right. And we'll get, we have a listener question coming up about that as yeah, well. Yeah, absolutely. So, so anyway, so all there's still, yeah, still a lot to unpack. We'll get to all of it. Yeah. But let's start with... So, right, I mean, at one point you were a brand new nugget in the, uh, as, as we call it, right, a first yep. tour in the F-18 uh, Super Hornet. Who gets to become an LSO? How, how does that work? Yeah, uh, great question. And I had the same question as, as I was kind of going through flight school. I remember being a T-45 guy, getting ready to go to the boat for the first time, really idolizing these LSOs as you get in that phase. They're always great, you know, always seem to be the greatest instructors, not just at exactly. that, but just mm -hmm. as a dude, you know, great, great uh, individuals, he or she. Uh, and I always was like, well, I'm just, you, you just are, you're drawn to it almost. Um, so that's where my interest for sure started. And what I always tell, you know, when I was at CAG paddles, FRS paddles, or now force paddles, I get that question quite often from that same nugget that I was, you know, humpty amount of years ago. Mm -hmm. Um, and the first thing I tell them is I want you to focus on being the best ball flyer and the most disciplined, you know, around the boat as right. possible. That's step one. Like, I, I don't need you to be top hook every single line period. I need you to be consistent, safe, predictable. Mm -hmm. And then when you can kind of do that and you get in a groove and you get good at that, you know, the LSOs have already graded a couple hundred of your passes on a cruise or a workup. So, you know. We know, we know the problem children, and we know the athletes just like you do on a baseball team. Same kind of idea. And then from there, it's just showing interest. Um, you know, standing on the platform, you know, asking your squadron LSO is like, hey, can I, can I grab a flow code and go on the platform with you? And it's kind of showing face mm -hmm. and showing interest. Um, and then going from there, standard Navy company line timing right we yeah. kind of apply that to everything you got to make sure you have the, the amount of time in the squadron to be able to go through the training obtain the quals and then pursue whether you want to continue to pursue waving go from there so be good around the boat show face okay have a good bar game too <laughs> not a, like a completely out of control bar game right. but a, you know yeah a solid bar game okay so when you were at vfa in 97 i was there but before they got super hornets yeah um so were you guys a 10 plane paa they used to call it i, I forget yeah. what that stands uh, for but your squadron had 10 planes so you had what 15 pilots yeah 10 jet echo squadron okay uh single seat so <laughs> hey whiz those are people too <laughs> so how many lso's in a squadron of that size and to be fair the top two or the coxo there may have been lso's but they won't be actively waving correct middle management uh, department heads probably about three or four of those so really maybe what eight or nine jos as eight we or call nine them JOs, yeah how many of those will be lso's yeah so the, the basic construct in an air wing so you usually have two cag lso's per air wing um, just so you're not waving every day and you can fly on deployment. Mm -hmm. So the two senior guys will alternate fly days, which is a good time. Uh, and then each squadron, whether it's Rhino, Growler, Lightning, or Hawkeye, man's, we're manned for four from each squadron. Oh, wow. um, and they try to spread that out senior to junior. You know, as a guy's leaving, if he was an LSO leaving that squadron, now they got a seat to fill another guy. In some circumstances, especially as we're like ending a cruise or where we know we're going to get a lot of waving, maybe we'll plus it up to five. Yeah, but that's the timing you were talking about. Exactly. Right? The timing just yeah. isn't working. If you got a bunch of guys okay. that already have the qual and they're not leaving anytime soon, it might not work out, you know, because now you're eating time in the squadron. Uh, and then by the time maybe that guy leaves, you got a year and a half left and we can't really train you. We like to get two years on guys at least. Um, 
So yeah, four squadrons from there. All right, sorry, four LSOs per squadron. Okay. It's kind of a long answer. No, that's all right. And then, so when you started, let's just use your example. Sure. Um, you show up out there, and I think it was uh, Trey Kalish, our night trap guy who was an LSO. He says, you get out there, and they all look the same, right? The passes. Yeah. Just like a, a, an umpire <laughs> trying to uh, yeah. <laughs> call pitches. Yeah. But after a while, you start seeing different things. So uh, what's, what's involved in the training? Let's start with that, and then uh, if you forget the second part, I'll come back to it. But then, right, there's different quals because you're not just – you show up and boom, you're force paddles. Yep. Uh, but I don't even know how much higher you can go than force paddles. But walk me through like the different way you get trained and then how high can you go and, and what are the quals? Yeah, this is a good conversation. And the listeners probably have a lot of questions about this as well. Um, yeah, so the initial training, what I think is so impressive about the initial training about the LSO community is it's, it's, it's OJT, it's on the job. Mm -hmm. uh, it is beyond the platform. And once you're on a wave team, let's say you got selected, we call that being the first step is get a nomination letter. So you you are now nominated to go through LSO training and basically a squadron and one of your squadron LSOs, which has to be signed by the skipper, agreed by by CAG paddles, agreed by by CAG. So it's you know it's a pretty vetted process. Mm -hmm. uh, once you get that nomination, now we uh, I guess blessing or we're blessing you <laughs> with uh, our knowledge, I should say. Yeah, yeah. Kind of a <laughs> kind of a cocky term. Uh, but we're going to bring you into a wave team. You're going to get worked into a rotation, and we're going to train you on what to do. You always start on kind of these back jobs back here. You're going to be – Timing. You're going to work on – you know, you're going to be the timing guy for recovery. We're going to teach you how to write. Writings, you do a lot of time writing passes and getting good at that. And then after you get reps and, and then call on the deck, which we haven't really talked about here, we have an LSO that calls the deck, basically looks – backwards as we're watching the aircraft to ensure the deck's not foul on the port side of the ship. Actually uh, looking forward, arguably, yeah, by sorry, the ship forward, standards. if you will. Backwards but, for but me. For I'm me, always looking. You know, wherever right. I'm looking it's is reference. right. Yeah, so it's backwards <laughs> relative to me. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, that's the right answer. Yeah. Uh, but, yeah, so those kind of junior – we call those the junior positions. So deck caller, timing, rider. Okay. Uh, and you kind of go through that. And then when you're not really doing something, you know, because we rotate everybody through positions based off seniority and training, so everyone can learn how to do all of these things uh, so that you can leave your squadron as a wing-qualified LSO, which I'll get to what that means uh, when we kind of talk about quals. When, you know, I always preach to there's a team lead of this besides me, so I'm just kind of managing everything, and then the, a team lead is managing his guy, his his baseball player, his diamond. and making Because sure you could be grooming that person for your job later. Exactly. So by making them a team lead, I'm saying, hey, I want you to go be an FRS paddles and a CAC paddles, uh, and you try to make them get obtain that wing qual, which allows them to pursue that uh, adventure post their JO tour. And you grab this kid and be like, hey, stand behind me. We're both going to watch this plane land. I want to hear what you think he did. And then, you know, if he's kind of close, you'd be like, okay, you know, 50-50. And what's actually interesting is the concept of teaching someone to watch an airplane land and then know where exactly that airplane was. And we call it walking the pass backwards. So when we're actively waving a jet daytime, let's talk day because it's a little bit easier. Mm -hmm. We're not actually looking at the aircraft itself. We're looking at, we're staring directly at the hook point because all we care about is where that hook point touches down on the flight deck. Normal to, normal targeting, four wire boat, in between the two and the three wire, it's 230 feet is the number. So basically directly in between, let's just as an example, directly in between the two and the three wire. But 233, 230, 230 feet from the back of from the, the ship. From the aft of the ship yeah. to that touchdown okay. point. Yep. From there, you know, so if you see, if you watch this hook point, you try to slow it down. You know, for the love of the game style, try to slow it down, <laughs> clear the mechanism. <laughs> and if you watch a thing drill right in between the two and the three wire, you know that he was on glide slope. So he probably saw, he or she probably saw a centered ball on the lens when they landed. Now, let's talk about some other examples. If they grab a three wire on the fly, so that hook point grabs the three wire, there's no way that they were on exactly on glide slope, right? They had to have been a little bit high. Because they grab it's physics, right? <laughs> so you explain this to this guy, and when I heard it for the first time, I was like, "Oh my god, this makes so much sense! Mm -hmm. It's incredible." <clears throat> so I really focus on them. Hey, just tell me where the hook touchdown point was, and just do that for a hundred passes. And just tell me exactly where it touched down, and what does that mean on mm -hmm. glide slope for the pilot landing? Then from there, when we talk about building the pass backwards, like, all right, cool. He flew into the two wire. He had to have been a little low because he grabbed the two wire on the fly. We're targeting past it. Okay, I know he grabbed the two wire. He was a little low. 
Then you try to, this is where the experience comes in and watching thousands of these things. Okay, so how did he get a little low? Well, he looked like, you know, at the start, he looked like where he should be. Okay, so we're going to say an on and on start, right? Mm -hmm. He was on glide slope. But then, like, somewhere out here, I, you know, I saw a big puff of smoke and he got low and then he kind of just stayed there. Okay, cool. Perfect. That's exactly what he did on the pass. How do we write that down now? Right? Uh, you know, and there's a million ways to do it. Uh, but that's kind of the idea. And then the, the philosophy generally of how we train a, train a guy to just use his eyeballs to see mm -hmm. deviations in glide slope. And it's a reps and sets game. It really is. Yeah. You, yeah. Wa you watch 50,000 you know, 50, of these things, and you, you get pretty good at it. And yeah. then that's where I come in, right, as a CAG paddles, because you'll hear, you'll hear a pass get called out, and you know, like, nah, I'm usually, like, very quiet. I'm usually softy. You know, I give them a hug. He's like, no, nah, they were here. No, nah, I'm yelling at them. I was like, <laughs> absolutely not. It happened here. Right. Well, so the alternative to uh, – and I'll talk for a little while so you can uh, have a sip. Oh, that's um, so thirsty. The, the alternative to what – for just in a scenario here, that to what you just explained is maybe instead of going a little low from his on and on, maybe he went a little high. Right. And now he over-controlled, which is one of the comments you guys can make, the yeah. high, and flew through. Exactly. And so now he was high, but now he went low, and, yep. and all these are part of the – right? It's an art and a science. It's I truly mean, an art. Yeah. I mean, there's science based off it. Uh, you know, you look in LSO NATOPS, CV NATOPS, and there's these, these engineers made these beautiful things. But for a 1.9 <laughs> GPA high school boy like me, I'm like, I'm like I don't know, you know. <laughs> I'm sure that's all right. It's got to be yeah, right because yeah. this guy's saying it is, and he put it in a book, so he's smart if it's in a book. <laughs> but the art form is knowing the right piece of sky, mm -hmm. seeing the deviations, and not only just staring at the hook, seeing what the jet's doing. Are you seeing a puff of smoke coming out of the jet? Flight are you, controls. Yeah, are you seeing flight controls flailing around, all mm -hmm. these kind of things? And, you know, you just incorporate that over and over and over again. Yeah, yeah. And then you start to get good at it. I'm trying to think of a movie example, but I feel like there's a lot of them where – they start off like the scenario in the movie is they're in some other country, so they're speaking that language. Yeah. But all of a sudden, as you watch the movie, like it morphs into English. Right. So now you kind of understand it. And I'm wondering if it's the same. Like, again, this new guy that comes out there, <laughs> yeah. like, that looked exactly like the one before it. But after a while, it's like, oh, I'm starting to see or understand. Yeah, or, it, it clicks for yeah. sure. Uh, I, and I think where that implies uh, applies the most is LSO shorthand, especially – Let's talk about the receiving end of hearing LSO shorthand. So you're not a paddles and you're a nugget. You've never heard this. You, you know, you've heard this over and over again because you've heard passes read to you every single time as you do 200, 300 field carrier landing practices, not on the ship. Right. But I don't think general, generally people are able to absorb most of it, especially when you're underway and everyone's type A alpha personality and they just want to hear. All they want to hear is okay. <laughs> Right, for the grade, because that's the best grade you can get is an okay. Well, underline okay, extreme circumstance, but right. a 4.0 is an okay. And usually, you know, you get the training off. You fare out, let's say we fare out the training officer. I'll do a Top Gun pop on you. Training goes, training goes in paddles. We always butt heads. I'll bet. There's a lot of history there. <laughs> uh, that's good bar talk for later. Sure, sure. Uh, but you fare them out, and they don't listen to a single thing. You when you say, say fare them out, like a B. Yeah, so you get instead of an okay, you give them a fair, which means it was a safe pass, right? But there were larger deviations that wouldn't warrant an okay grade. Or a small deviation, but the correction was too big. Was that one of them Correct. as well? Same okay. thing, too. Yeah. And uh, Or you give them the no grade, right, which means really extreme deviations, unsafe pass, the legendary one wire. You hit the one wire, you're getting stitched. <laughs> on my on my float coat, I'm not, not on this one, but on my other float coat, my little flap here, I just pull it up. It just says stitch him in a grease pen <laughs> if, if he goes into the one wire. It's pretty yeah. legendary. Yeah. I mean, that's a no-brainer, right? Yeah. But then people will still argue that. The training L will hit me. It was like, well, was it like a safe one wire? <laughs> It's, it's like, it wouldn't be there if you like, didn't what? want me to catch yeah, it. Here Come we on. go. You're a boarding hey, rate oh, guy. I, hey, I got a lot of one You're a boarding rate guy. Yeah. <laughs> I knew it. That's what that patch does. Admin, right? Uh, um, so it's really the shorthand. And I have to even still train, you know, LSOs that have been waving for a few years on how to properly call a pass. Because what they, what they tend to do, and I'm sure you can probably attest, you probably have been at least read one pass where – there's like six or six to nine different comments when you can really blend that into like three more is less in kind of my mind mm. because where was he here where was he here what wire did he grab how did he get there mm. and you get these cute passes with like all these lso terms that 
yes, are technically in the book, but no one ever uses, right? <laughs> Climb on, come on, or something weird. That's, oh yeah, that's right. So I am writing my <laughs> memoirs right now, and I just got <laughs> yeah. done with the chapter on fleet C- or uh, training command CQ, which I did in the A4, uh-huh. and I actually still have the sheet with all my passes. Oh, that's oh yeah, cool. they're they're like several letters yeah. long because one guy even hit me too wide to beam. So you guys are watching oh, us, you know, from yeah. like you said earlier, from we the are, 180. Yeah. But yeah, I was too wide to beam, not enough straightaway or whatever it was. But yeah, it, but it, put your point being is you can't just have suddenly high and then suddenly low. You have right. to over control it or you settle. Something or, happened to get you. Right. There. So it's, 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 it's the progression. And so getting back to the original question a long time ago was the, and that's on me, not on you. The, um, the, the point is you're getting somebody out there and they're just getting those reps by being out there day exactly. in, day out with other people who have been through that journey and they're, Padawan, right? Hey, Padawan. this. let me show you what this is like. And, exactly. and now you'll start seeing it in my horrible movie analogy. Now you start to understand it's starting to sound like English. Right. And you can see, oh, yeah, okay. He was a little high, and then there was no smoke at all for a little while, then a whole bunch. Right. And, you know, and that, oh, by the way, someone made a power call. So, yeah. Uh, but there's glide slope, there's lineup, there's length in the groove that you talked about. Yep. There's the pattern itself. And then, of course, there's in the wires because it's not yeah. over, it's not until, over. Um, yeah. until you're done at full power in the wires so exactly all right so there might be more on that we can come back to it sure um but tell me because you already alluded to one of them a wing call yeah Uh, and some of this if i remember correctly relayed on a number of maybe either deployments or passes but there was also like a field call like we do this out at the field exactly and so you need to have some experience with that before you progress up this path yeah, so nomination at step one, you're going to become an LSO. Field qual is usually the next one. Okay. Um, Even depend- if you start on deployment? Yeah, d- depending on the end. Yeah, okay. if you start on deployment, obviously you can't get one. But that's kind of the dream progression if we can. Uh, but the two next ones, which are is your field qual and then your squadron LSO qual. So field qual is exactly what you call it. Um, it's pretty straightforward. The training isn't too much there. It's more just there's a couple differences with the lens at the field. Uh, the LSO shack where we spend, you know, I don't even want to know how many hours I've spent sitting in oh, the Oh, good. Lamar, you went somewhere else with that. Sitting in the Lamar <laughs> LSO shack. Yeah, that's that's for the unedited. Okay. Uh, the the, the extra edited ones later. Um, but you got to learn how to you know make sure that the radios are different, the lens is different. So it's just one of your boys from your squadron making sure, like, hey, this is how this works at the field. This is how you get there in the truck stuff like that yeah. uh and then the waving there's different because depending on where you're sitting it doesn't necessarily look exactly like the bow in terms of glide slope so you got to get used to that mm-hmm. squadron qual is your next one um that's just based off time experience uh cag paddles hands out all these quals to their guys as they progress and what's that saying is you're kind of a mid-level senior-ish lso with kind of a mid-level lso so you've been waving for probably about a year in your squadron uh, and they trust you to be able to basically teach lectures uh, to your squadron for workups and stuff like that. So teach uh, carrier procedure lectures, LSO concepts, stuff like that, as well as train up another LSO on that one aircraft. So F-18. That's, you read my mind. That's yep. where I was going with Yeah, that. so that's aircraft. A squadron calls aircraft specific. So F-18, Hawkeye, F-35. And then if you if you are successful enough and you go through everything and you go through the team lead process and two to three years of waving, your goal when you're leaving your JO squadron is to obtain a wing qual. Wing qual says, um, and to loop it back, if I can't make it to the platform for whatever reason, if a CAG paddles can't make it there, if you're a wing qualified LSO by the book, you are qualified to land aircraft on the boat without a CAG paddle, sir. So that's all variants. So you got to have an understanding of all variants within that air wing, mm-hmm. all variants within the Navy. Uh, and that's kind of your ultimate goal. And what that does is that unlocks then the ability for you to go to the FRS to continue to be an LSO. You, if you show up to the FRS as an instructor without a wing qual, you can't then become, you can't wave at okay. the SR as an instructor. Okay. Then from there, training qual, which you'll get as an FRS paddles, um, which a training qual is the same thing. I'm a giving training quals FRS paddles on the next boat. Uh, and that's me just basically, do you have an understanding of how to teach a kid when he's struggling? Do you have an ability to run a debt, essentially an FRS CQ debt or a CQ debt? Do you know how air plans work, all this kind of stuff? Because by me putting my, my stamp, you know, my name on your training qual, I'm saying, I want you to go be a CAG paddles, or you have the ability to go be a CAG paddles. You see the bigger picture, you understand the environment. And you've been doing this for a while. You're competent. You're confident. All that kind of fun stuff. Mm-hmm. 
And then once you're a CAG paddles, the final qual we have is a staff qual. So you'll get that with from your other CAG paddles as you turn over okay. when you check in. And then staff qual uh, is the highest qual you can get. And that is basically saying that you can now give all these quals to everybody, okay. if that makes sense. Yes. Um, and like then, a CF double I almost in exactly. The, in so the now, yeah. So a staff qual allows you to now give quals. That's really the big thing from there. Train, teach, lead, all that kind of fun stuff. Um, and yeah, that's okay. quals. All right, uh, but you're force paddles. Correct. So is that just the billet at CNAF that you're kind of overseeing this, or how high can a guy go? Yeah, so it kind of stops at force paddles. Okay. Um, so we have two. There's one for East Coast, West Coast. Right. So like I said earlier, I work for CNAF. Then there's another Force Paddles on the East Coast. It works for Sea Now, uh, which is just the Atlantic Fleet version, mm -hmm. essentially. Mm -hmm. uh, and what we, what we are mainly in charge of is FRS CQ. So we go, you know, I, I manage all the West Coast boats and air wings for FRS CQ. FRS CQ is when you're brand new to the F-18, F-35, Hawkeye, Growler, and you're going to the boat for the first time in that aircraft. Right. That's what we call FRS CQ. Uh, so I manage all that, and then I also manage all the CAG paddles uh, in their air wing, and then you know the staffing for them as appropriate. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, so hold on. Um, isn't there like an LSO school and like simulators and different things? And there's probably an OIC officer in charge yep. of that. Yep. Talk about that. Yeah. So we call it the four horsemen. So there's the two LS force LSOs that I talked to. Sinatra, the training command, has a head LSO as well, and then the fourth is the uh, LSO school OIC. Uh, and what the LSO school is in Virginia Beach, Oceana, which I'm okay. sure you're very familiar with. Actually, uh, I never was based there, but I am familiar. Plenty of, plenty of trips there. Oh, yeah. Sure. yeah, I've never been based there either, but plenty of bad decisions. So <laughs> as, you're, as you're obtaining these, these different qualifications I was talking to, you also have to go to the LSO school to do a ground portion in order for it to be official. And so that's for uh, IFGT is the first one. This is a two-week-long course. IF. GT. Gosh, I, a Winkle. If you're listening, I'm so sorry. We I can get remember. it later and put it in the yeah. uh, subtitle. Um, <laughs> All right. Anyway. So the base of your first course is allows you to officially get your wing qual, which I'm talking to. So once your CAG paddle says I'm going to make you a wing qual, you got to go to the LSO school for the okay. two week course to get it in your NATOPS jacket to make it official. And the same thing goes training qual. You go there, and then when you are selected for CAG paddles and selected by an air wing to go there, you go there one last time for mm -hmm. a three-day refresher on kind of CAG paddle specifics. Um, but it's great, you know. That's where you really dive in the weeds where, you know, the lecture series is amazing. You talk about everything from how arresting gear works, how catapult, like in detail, which you might not be able to get from your CAG LSO. And then they have a simulator there, which is very unique. It's actually the old, that building is the old Tomcat sim building. Oh, wow. So it's, you know, it's big, it's huge, it's got all this room for it. Um, but there's a simulator in there that has an LSO platform, looks full up, and then about a, you know, 220 degree wrap screen, basically from the 180 into the wire is this giant screen around you. Um, and it can be manipulated to have jets land, have different emergencies, have different weather. Uh, you can do Movilis, you can do Barricade, you can do everything you want. So you get a bunch of sim training there, especially in that two-week initial course, mm -hmm. just to see kind of these, you know, adverse conditions with weather or extreme emergencies that maybe you'll never get exposed to uh, with the advancement of aircraft yeah. as we have them now. So it's a very good training course. And it's no different than what I do in my airline capacity is we have simulators where yep. we can train engine out or other yeah, emergencies, same exact which idea. usually it's so reliable most of the time nothing ever happens, but right. we need those skills in yep. case. And so does the simulator, it can throw at him somebody who's diving for the back of the ship and he can practice getting – Oh yeah, really agitated and screaming power and wave off and all that. Yeah, sometimes yeah. sometimes it's kind of binary ones and zeros. The models in there will kind of go silly, okay. but the the thought is, you know, the models will respond to you. Okay. The LSO as they're making oh. calls and stuff yeah. like that. Well, as so. technology continues to improve, of course, the Navy will only be twenty years behind, but at some point, they <laughs> as should, is tradition. Yeah, yeah they should be able to get it. <laughs> so hold on, I just reminded myself of that. We talked about the shorthand and the book and the way yep. the passes are written. And by the way, I have to think you guys probably email each other in this code. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so terminology is important, right? The things you say, the things you don't say, because I yep. need to interpret that, that correctly with stick and throttle. So talk to me about the things that you'll say on the radio if, in fact, you uh, choose to transmit. Yeah. I mean, uh, the best pass is always the one where I don't have to talk, right? That's even the goal when I'm flying. It's like, oh, thank God, paddles <laughs> didn't talk to me. I guess it was okay. Are you going to say okay? Uh, but, yeah, so we try to say the same things, uh, and we we focus out a lot on our workups during the FCLPs, uh, like – 
right for lineup come left. You know, we don't say it any other way. Right. In other words, you don't say right for lineup, yeah. left for lineup. Right. Because if I only way. heard lineup. Right. So if okay. you heard lineup or left or if the radio cut out, whatever reason, you know, stuff like that. So there's really three kind of categories. Also, Natops breaks it down. We trained it this way as well. It's informative, advisory, uh, and imperative. So informative is basically just like me for whatever reason, whether it's a talk down, whatever reason I feel like I need to make the call. The easiest one is you're on glide slope. Right. Maybe you heard something different or maybe, you know, I use this a lot when uh, the old it's it's inevitable that the helicopter is going to talk on the ball right when they take off spot seven. <laughs> you know, like, you know, you know they're going to yeah, talk yeah, on yeah. the ball. So I always throw out as my kind of waving technique. I'll say you're on glide slope. In other words, I'm taking back the radio. It's like, hey, everyone, you know where yeah, you are. Everyone shushies, shushies yeah, yeah, yeah. for 15 seconds. And then the pilot at least gets a useful piece of information right. there. Um so, yeah, you're on glide slope. It's kind of you're on center line. They're just telling you what's going on. Advisory means whether we, we can see a situation developing and we don't want it to. So, uh, you know, like the don't settle or don't climb are kind of two ones that always stick out of my mind. Maybe, and I see this a lot with students where, you know, maybe on the last three passes, you know, they're adding too much power and they're on the bolter train now. So their bolter means you're missing all the wires. All right. Uh, and so maybe, you know, I'm, I'm staged where I see he's, he or she's getting ready to climb, and I'll just throw out a don't climb call right away. Be like, stop what you're doing, hold what you have, basically. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. And then imperative is something's really not cool. It's not chill right now. We need to do something to change the state of the aircraft or the position of the aircraft, or else it's going to result in an unsafe pass, a wave off, or something we don't want at all. Mm -hmm. So those are your traditional power calls, probably screaming power calls for you, tagging the ace <laughs> at night, I would assume. Uh, so power calls, lineup calls, those yeah. are the big ones, uh, and things like that. But there's an art to that too, right? Because if you say to me, power, right, that's sort of pleasant. Like just, right. It's almost like a don't settle. Yeah. But if you say, and I've heard it plenty, <laughs> power. <laughs> yeah. like, like the it's, grumpy it's one. Gotta, yeah. yeah, the grumpy yeah. one. Uh, yeah, I had Rusty Barber. I don't know if you ever knew him. He was a uh, CAC paddles. He he gave me like three or four daytime power calls. I don't know why I needed it, but one of <laughs> one of them like you're, if you you're on uh, exactly too. Ball. But one of them like had like a like if you were to plot it somehow on a, on a piece of paper, it was like power. Like it was like a roller coaster. <laughs> yeah. Like it went through this. Yeah. Like but um, <laughs> but the point is right. You can say things, um, and you only say certain things. And, I, and correct me if I'm wrong. Part of this was I think learned in tragedy because True. working on speed I think was part of the the issue with that T two. True. That crash and the student didn't know what that meant compared to what the LSOs Correct. implied. Correct. So now you're slow or yeah. power is more informative, but it's not just what you say, it's how you say it. Yeah, yeah. So voice inflection, like you said, is huge too. If I want a little correction, whether it's lineup or, you know, glide slip control, maybe just like little power. Like just give me a little love. Mm -hmm. But you know, if it's a big one, you know, you're gonna say it louder, more emphasis on it. Same thing with lineup and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, and it, you know, in our training, we teach these kids, you know, this is what we try to say over and over again. There's literally a list of and it'll say like power. Power means the aircraft's low. You want the aircraft to do that. it breaks it down Barney style like that. You know, it's almost <laughs> like too this. much. Right. <laughs> it's almost too much. Yeah. But that's how in depth it is. Mm -hmm. Um, and really the only time we deviate from that, it's usually the senior LSO. So the CAG or the force paddles, and it's that bad weather day and you're channeling your inner bug roach and you're feeling salty <laughs> and you're doing, you know, a paddles talk down where maybe you'll say something non-standard, but it still applies. If okay. that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Yeah. And I know uh, we'll get the grades in a minute, but usually like, oh, dang it. They had to talk to me. Uh, that means my grades are going to suffer. But wait a minute. Hold, earlier, we, we showed these paddles and we showed some pictures of guys. They're not holding radios. I mean, how did they do it in the old days? Uh, how did they? <laughs> I mean, there was you didn't talk to me on the radio, right? If you and uh, I could correct. go back 80 years ago. Yeah. Um, so I, I guess... Just, yeah, just paddles and looking outside, right? Well, you know, if we didn't have radios. Uh, and then we do that now, too. We call it zip lip recoveries. Mm -hmm. um, we, on the lens, essentially, there's a we call them the cut lights. So there's a series of green lights up there. Uh, mm -hmm. And the pickle here, which I brought, uh, this is the other thing that I'm sure listeners have seen in a bunch of pictures. Like, what, is, what does this thing do? Right. Um, so this is called the pickle. And all, it's got two buttons on it. The, the front one here will control the wave off lights. So if the deck goes foul, we never get a clear deck or whatever, uh, you're going to press this button. Oh, don't be polite. The yeah. pilot could screw it up the bad enough. The pilot could screw it up, right? I'm trying to save you with the foul deck for your GPA here, Jello. I'll save you with the foul deck. 
Uh, uh, everything's subjective. Yeah. Uh, and then the top one controls the cut lights, which I'm talking about. So um, what we tend to do with those is when we're doing deployed case one recovery, so daytime recovery with an approach turn, or case two, same thing, just different weather mids. Mm -hmm. Instead of calling the ball, which we do in CQ or which we do at night, uh, we do what's called zip lip. So aircraft comes around the corner, and as they're basically going through the wake of the boat, you'll hear the primary LSO say cuts, which means he's holding down the cut lights. The LSOs will hear that. I don't hear that as You don't pilot. hear that, right, yeah. Right. So, and what that does is that turns on these four green lights on the lens. It's, they're very apparent. We turn them up higher than everything else so you can see them. Uh, always a fun game during FCLPs to see if guys will notice cut lights at the field. They never do. I got a 100% <laughs> bar success rate of winning a beer over that one. Nice. Um, and so that's basically us telling the pilot coming around the corner, hey, we are now taking control. If during that pass, if we can get away with it, if the pa you know, if, if I want to make a little power call, I'm just going to tap the lights real quick. And that's just basically saying that's basically all we can do with them now. We can right. only kind of control them on glide slope with cut lights only. So we try to not talk during zip lip recoveries. Obviously, CAG paddles, if there's a giant safety, we're going to talk yeah. if we need to for safety every single time. But that's kind of the idea in another way that it can be controlled. Um, and the, the the other thing about the pickle, um, I don't know if we'll get to this, but you'll see like in this picture over here, which we have up there, the pickles are all down. So that means there's a clear deck. You've seen on all, you know, Top Gun Pop, Top Gun 1, Top Gun Maverick, where the LSOs are holding this above their head. This is the signal to not only all the LSOs on the platform to remind us, but it's basically saying, hey, the deck is foul. So we cannot catch an airplane right now mm -hmm. uh so that's kind of a just a muscle memory thing that we train into lso's you're going to hold that thing up until we get a clear deck then you can bring it down and sure. if the deck ever goes foul again pickles are straight back up in the air it's just a physical thing you can do physical so thing muscle memory right, thing yeah. and then it also kind of communicates it to you know the tower and as you, and anybody watching hey why their hands are up why are their hands oh the deck's foul yeah and there's also a sense. status light. We can't see it in that image. Yeah, I think we have one later of it. But, yeah, sure. Um, and then, right, so every time I, I'm listening to you, I'm like, oh, I can ask him about this. <laughs> so <laughs> I, have triggers, to, yeah. I have to uh, temper my enthusiasm here. But um, there are different levels of foul, right? And in other words, if it's just the wires retracting, it's not quite set, but otherwise it's ready, Correct. you can bring me, if I'm the pilot, a little closer, Correct. hoping to get me at the last second, Correct. versus if there's an airplane in the way, yep. it's bigger. So those are what, windows, I guess? Yeah, so we run two different wave off windows. When the when the when there is a foul deck so 10 foot window and a 100 foot window okay 100 foot window is our more conservative wave off window um and going back to the deck caller they'll be screaming 100 you'll hear this in videos i'm sure on youtube or of the platform you'll be hearing this lso usually our new lso and we tell them to be louder and more enthusiastic and mess with them <laughs> he'll be screaming 100 which is telling all of us because we're all watching the plane land i can't be watching the plane land getting rid of wave them off or grade them or do any of this if i'm having to look over my shoulder as well to see the status of the flight deck where the wires are is there a jbd up is there a plane in the la so that young brand new lso could save the day 100 foot window basically means if we don't get down to our next window, which is 10, by the time that I, myself, or any of the LSOs hit the wave off lights, the tail hook or just the jet in general should be 100 feet over the flight deck as it's crossing by. The gouge for that is the jet should be flying basically above the island, okay. which is the tower there on the boat. Once we're like right there, you know, the gear is set, we have the winds. There's no jets in the LA. The foul lines are clear. We will then move that into a 10 foot wave off window. Same exact terminology, but we're gonna push that down to now literally aircraft flying 10 feet over the deck if we don't get a clear deck. Once we get a clear deck, green light, everyone says clear, pickles come down, cool. We're gonna trap the jet. Yeah, and that means a lot of things. The foul lines are clear of any intrusions. Could, Correct. Somebody could still step over it. It happened Correct. plenty. Yeah, uh, but the does. resting gear is set for the aircraft that's coming and uh, everything else is set. Yep. I'm sure there's more. Which, by the way, um, I, I meant to ask you about this earlier, but part of being an LSO is, right, the bulletins, I guess? Is that what you guys call it? Knowing the wind, knowing the gear setting. I mean, not too, like, beeps and squeaks of the sailors underneath but yep. a lot of that not just where is he and what is he doing yep. uh, but some of that arresting gear uh, part of it as well right yeah exactly so like I kind of said it's at some point during this awesome conversation <laughs> uh, each jet 
has a different recovery headwind. So the minimum amount of wind that has to be blowing down the LA in order for that jet to safely land yeah. and not break anything, not break the jet, you know, not rip a tail hook off, not break the arresting gear motors b- beneath. Um, and then the company with that, like you said, is a weight setting to now the gear itself. Uh, so that is all part of the training we do. And uh, the bulletin you refer to, ARBs, paddles. I know you love ARB drills with me. Uh, I was a real stickler on these. Oh, good. Uh, so basically what that means is we have a jet, and it's this giant binder. It's crazy. It goes through every type of aircraft with every potential emergency that you could have that's going to affect its ability. And really when we say that, we think of the big things, flight controls, engines, yeah. right? Something <clears throat> like that that's going to affect approach speed. So either the jet's going to, most of the time, the jet's going to be flying faster for whatever reason. So it's going to have to have more of an impact on the gear, higher approach speed, more stress on the gear, more stress on the aircraft. It's this crazy sheet, which you learn at the LSO school in depth. It's my favorite lecture. It's everyone's favorite lecture. It's like two days long. It's just eye-watering the ARB (laughs) two-part series at the LSO school. All right. Um, But it teaches you, you know, it's just a checklist, just like, you know, we're kind of checklist people in naval aviation and oh, yeah. aviation in general mm-hmm. and it runs you through of like all right here's our situation this is how many basically this is how how much wind the boat can give us over the deck uh because maybe it can't for whatever reason you know dragging a screw or you know weather or whatever reason maybe the boat can't give us all the wind what are we going to set the arresting gear to the proper way to make sure that nothing breaks and everyone lands safely and then we run that not only on the platform the towers running it I'm sure Cag's running it in his stateroom. I'm just kidding. Cag has no idea how that thing works. Uh, but it's basically us in the tower, and we run it separately. We don't talk to each other to make sure we come up with the same numbers. Okay. And if we don't come up with the same numbers, then we're like, all right, who fudged up? Yeah, like, yeah. Where, where are we wrong? So that's all part of everything we do. But if – so I can't remember what it was. Was the Super Hornet 44,000? Or uh, for We set com- the gear – well, yeah, 44,000 for the max trap weight. We right. set the gear to 480. Okay, because I remember in the Hornet, it was 34. Uh, at least that was my weight as yep. a max trap. So imagine a young Jello on a second deployment feeling pretty <laughs> salty. Go. I'm taking a sip is, of beer uh, Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> maybe, maybe he found his buddy uh, Pot Roast in his F-14, and they swirl around a little bit because it's daytime and it's beautiful. And, Gotta get and we're, we're naval aviators. And then we look down at our fuel and say, ooh, that's a little lower. <laughs> and so suppose young Jello comes around, lands okay, uh-huh. first pass, but yeah. – Fuel's maybe a little lower than he would want to admit to anyone. Never had to, uh, hypothetically. Definitely kept it to yourself. Uh, yeah, but it, <laughs> but the first number was a two. Um, <laughs> oh, that old boy. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm well below thirty four thousand. Uh-huh. Does does the jet care? Does the arresting gear care? I mean, uh, no, not at that point. the The arresting gear is is pretty intelligent. It'll you know, you set the gear, and as long as it's below that, it'll handle it. And even the Ford class now is this whole new arresting gear. I'm still trying to get smart on the Ford class gear, where it'll actually just sense, you know, deceleration pullout rate and adjust itself, wow. essentially. So we set, we still set the gear on the Ford like we do on traditional uh, Nimitz class boats. Uh, for now. For now, <laughs> right? Who knows yeah, what's yeah. going to happen. Yeah. Uh, but, the, uh, but, yeah, as long as you're below that, she's going to be all right. Okay. Everything's just fine. Yeah, okay. And you got the wind. You got to make sure you got the wind, too. Yeah. All right. Okay, so when I am coming down to land, park, make my way down to the red room, lo and behold, after a few minutes, a handful of folks wearing the uh, float coats you've got on your, uh, on your seat there yeah. come around and, and debrief us. We've talked about the calls I might hear. We've talked about the shorthand. Um, let's start with this. Why have grades? Yeah, why have grades? Always a good question. Um, it allows us the ability to really build trends off aviators, not only off aviators, but off an air wing as a whole once you kind of process it. So, you know, stickler to, we, we do all kinds of crazy things, the F-18, right? We do air to air, air to ground, BFM, all these different missions. But if you can't bring the jet back to the boat at the end of the day, you know, probably shouldn't be a naval aviator, at least a tail hook aviator uh, for sure. So in order to just build a paper trail on an individual, yeah, I mean, every single pass you and I have ever flown is sitting in a database somewhere. It's like the end of Indiana Jones where they open up this thing. <laughs> right. All of Jello's passes top. are in there somewhere. It's yeah. top secret. <laughs> it's not. It's on the pass. Yeah, yeah. Um, it allows us to train to it, to see when, when individuals are struggling, and then to also award them for, you know, being outstanding or above average ball flying, which is always a nice thing to do yeah. uh, for everyone, for sure. 
Uh, so that's really, really it. So that's interesting. That's not the answer I expected. Uh, not being a paddles, I always thought the reason we had grades was because it made the pilots try harder because we're all naturally competitive. I would agree. Mostly all, yeah. all generalized. And the byproduct of that is safety. Yeah. Because this is a very consequential activity that we Absolutely. engage in. So by making it a competition, everybody tries harder right. and they do better. Right. So that was my thinking. And then they get pissed off at paddles when they fair them out. <laughs> I'm getting that. And then I'm the bad guy <laughs> when I'm just trying to be your boy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but, yeah, that uh, kind of alludes to. So, um, yeah, after we're all done with the recovery, we get down, we talk about the passes. And then the legendary Angels in White. This is a little nickname because of the white float coats. Uh, the paddles train, as I'm sure you remember, walks ready room to ready room. Mm-hmm. And we try to find, to our best ability, granted, sometimes you don't see them right away, but you try to find the, all the pilots that just landed and read their pass exactly as we saw it, exactly as we called it, given their grade right there on the spot. And I think that's one of the coolest traditions we still do uh, to this day because it doesn't matter if you're, you know, I remember being a nugget paddles first day on primary, so first day like grading and then having to then read it to somebody. <laughs> And you know, it's like, oh man, a CAG landed, you know, an 06, a captain landed. It's like, wait, you look at CAG, but I was like, you want me to read it? It's like, yeah, you got to read it. You're a paddles now. Um, so that relationship where kind of rank is out the window, where you're reading a senior guy who's been landing on boats for maybe 20 years. Might have a thousand traps. Might have a thousand traps, <laughs> and you're getting ready to tell him what you think he did in the jet. It, it instills confidence, not only in them, but then it's all it goes back to that trust conversation. Yeah that we had before. And I love that we do that and, yeah. you know, respect each other. There's always banter. Yeah, There's yeah. always a little, you know, smack talking on the backside. Uh, but I love that tradition more than anything. All right. So again, this is great. Like you just keep throwing out these little gimmies. Uh, so nugget, no, not nugget by then, it's, you know, senior J O jello comes down, flies, whatever he flies. Uh, and then let's say the CAG comes down behind me. Does it matter to you guys? And by the way, we keep using the masculine, but right, right. guys, gals, we yeah. all we all know that. But yeah. it's just it's all good. for for yeah. Anyway. You, you mean in terms of uh, who who's flying what jet? <laughs> so in other words, when you're looking at my hook point, as yeah, I've learned sure. in this discussion, does it matter that it's Jello sitting in there versus the keg? No, it does not. Um, I I try to train and still to this day try not to wave you wave the jet, not the pilot. Yeah. Right. And you got to kind of force yourself to do this. And you got to be smart with that, too, because, you know, who's struggling. Obviously, that completely goes out the window. If someone's coming around the corner who's been on the struggle bus lately, low GPA, high bolter, something unsafe maybe just happened. Obviously, I'm going to be waving that pilot a little bit differently than I would somewhere else. But at the end of the day, the pass is the pass. What happened on glide slope and what wire you caught is history now. And that's what happened. Mm-hmm. And it doesn't matter if it's a striker, your bad roll or the newest guy in the squadron. That's your grade. Yeah. You know. Take it or love it. So when I went to VFA 86 as a nugget, that was a big boat proud squadron. Yeah. And what they told me is, Jello, when they come in, you don't say anything. You just say thank you. Yeah. And you stand <laughs> when they come in, right? Yeah. And uh, yep. et cetera, et cetera. I have to think you've probably waved tens of thousands of passes. <sighs> Too many. You've, you've seen everything, right? You've oh, seen yeah. the people that hopefully did what I was tra- taught to do. Uh-huh. Uh, and I have to think you've had some people like, oh, that's a bunch of crap. Yeah. Uh, I've I- seen everything from helmets being thrown. Really? A, a choke slam against a wall. I've seen it all. Wow. And d- how, don't be that guy. How do you, well, okay. That, that's, <laughs> that's the lesson learned for everyone watching. Or listening. Yeah. How do you handle that though? And again, that's part of probably your, as CAC ops, especially yeah. uh, duty is to train this young wing or squadron qual person to be able to handle those strong personalities. Cause guess what? There's a lot of them out there. At There's least there used to be maybe yep. less. So nowadays, I don't know. Yeah. So you kind of take the father mentality there, right? With your younger LSOs it's like, okay, just be the better person. Walk away from the situation. That's when the senior LSO will then, you know, start, you know, mm-hmm. okay, this is what we saw. Hey, you gotta remember we're training as well. We're not yeah. always going to be perfect. I saw the pass, you know, it was a fair pass. I mean, you yeah. touched us 50 feet in front of the two wire. <laughs> so there's no way that's yeah. an okay pass, you yeah. know, stuff like that. Kind of talk them off the ledge, mm-hmm. give them a hug, give them a that a boy. You just yeah. let them know you got their back. Yeah. Tell them you'll see them at mid rats for some pancakes and bacon after yeah. and then move on. All right. So 705 traps, 30 bolters, by the way, I, I kept track of my bolters, probably a handful of wave offs in there as well. Yeah. Never, ever did I, the LSO come in and say, Nice job, Jello. Okay, three. There was always something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, I, and I feel like the default was a little high come down all the way, okay, yeah. three. Yeah. Right. And again, I very rarely heard okay, three. But the point right. is, 
I mean, am, am I right? And if so, why? I mean, is, is it just a thing that you just never want to tell someone no comment? Or is it just that hard to get a no comment pass? I think a no comment pass, you know, the just like you said, a little high come down away. That's kind of my blanket. Hey, man, you were on glide the entire time. It was a rails pass. So why not just say that? So why not just say that? <laughs> Um, I try to save those those no comment passes for a, for a big moment, right? For guys' last trap in the Navy, guys' a thousands trap, stuff like that, where you're kind of giving them a, you know, they can have that one kind of line in their logbook. It was like, I got a nice job here. Oh, this is my thousand path, right? Assuming they flew the damn right, thing that right. way, right? <laughs> um, I think we can always be training and always be learning to something, even if it was a one ball high pass the whole way. I think it reads better to be a little high come down all the way than nothing. Mm. And that's just my right. take. Fair enough. <laughs> I have to look at my notes because I forgot what else. Oh, uh, with grades, of course, come trends, just like we had in school. Uh, you could finish in different percentiles of your class. Yep. So line periods and top 10. Talk to me about that. Line periods and top 10. Uh, yeah, so line periods is kind of how we break down a deployment, really. Uh, and it, let's say you do a six-month deployment, maybe four line periods. And what that is is – usually about 50 traps average from each pilot throughout the squadron in that line period. Unless you're a Hawkeye guy, then it's out the window. Maybe right. it's like 20, mid-20s or something like well, it that. It depends how much the air wing is flying, too. True, yeah. exactly. Yeah. So uh, you, you basically treat them like, you know, four quarters in a football game where you have a score at the end. And what we do is, you know, we run this Folksal Follies, which is a great tradition. Uh, I'm sure you have plenty of memories from there. That, Folksal Follies could be an episode on this. <laughs> it thing. should be, actually. But that's that's like a paid membership episode because there's some good <laughs> shenanigans there uh, that always goes down. But basically the entire air wing gets together at the end of every single one of these line periods. And it's such a good cause to just break up the monotony of living on the boat and all this stuff. Each squadron has a different crazy outfit they're wearing, um, you know, from the excitement of – you know, baseball jerseys or these guys are all dressed up and things like that. So there's skits and going on and we're kind of, you know, talking smack of funny things that have happened in that line period. And it's so much fun. It's a great time. Cag Powell's running the show, improv and comedy, looking at the front row, making sure we're not getting fired by Cag or the <laughs> boss right. for something sketchy, we probably said. Mm -hmm. uh, but then it allows us the ability to, to uh, you know, award guys that have performed well in that line period. Um, and there's, we basically break it down into top hook squadron. So the overall squadron that had the best landing grades, uh, that'll determine who's going to hang out at 2k, which is the lowest altitude at the case one stack where everybody wants to be, uh, top 10 hook for overall, and then also top five nugget. So the top five new guys, first deployment ever, uh, go from there. And if we do all the math at the end, luckily it's all in a computer now, not yeah. by hand. <laughs> um, and we'll get for every single pilot in the air wing, we'll get GPA boarding rate number of passes. And then from there, we just rack and stack them based off that who had the best GPA boarding rate comparison. Mm -hmm. Me and the other CAG paddles are arguing is like, no, this one goes here, but it's all just based off statistics. And now you get to be awarded, you know, something cool to throw on the Winnebago jacket. Like we call it, you know, throw a top hook patch on your sleeve and be proud of, you know, because those take a lot of work, you know, get a top hook patch. You know, I've gotten a few of them. I'm sure you have maybe. Uh, and I think anybody who has, I remember kind of getting my first, I got a top nugget patch on my first deployment. Oh, wow. And it was like the most proud, I think, one of the most proud I've ever been personally in my naval career. Yeah. And I still kind of remember that feeling, you know, and how much work I put into being that aviator. And if we can instill that over and over again, spread out through line periods, that's what makes us the best in the world at landing on boats. Yeah, by no, I agree. The flip side of that is when you are blue collar, as I admitted earlier, <laughs> it, it gets a little demoralizing after a while because, you know, there was always guys that made it look so easy. <laughs> right. And I worked my butt off and it just did not come easy to me. Yeah. So 700, like I said, 705 traps. So if we do your math, right, that may be 35 line periods, but you have CQ. So call it maybe 25. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So let me show you how many, we got. how many I ended up with. We got two on there. Two. Yeah, two's better than none. <laughs> two. And they were, by the way, CAG 11. That was when I was a train officer in department head. Both times, by the way, I had no idea. I was sitting over there coking and joking. Catch where again the top hooks. I, I love that. Well, yeah, I made it's it in. But, but I was surprised. I heard my name called. like, wait, what? <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I had a, um, as we'll get to, and you've already alluded to it, um, when I was a senior JO is when I developed this, I had a pass. I, it was my signature pass at night. And uh, to my earlier question about comments or no comments, 
I would apparently be rails all the way down, and I would either get deck rush or something would happen, sure. and I'd go underpowered. And so my <laughs> it was called the Jello One Arrival. It oh, was here we go. Not enough power in close, low at the ramp, no grade one. <laughs> And I would, you can, you know, after with some proficiency, you can kind of see where you land and stop and where the yellow shirt is. You're like, oh, another uh, one. I did it again. So paddles would come in at night. I'm like, yeah, I know. I'm sorry, paddles. Uh, yeah. really Forgive trying. me for I have sinned. But the corollary to that, I have to tell you this story real quick. And I think for <laughs> my listeners and viewers, they've heard it, but uh, you might enjoy this. So our XO was a former paddles. Because again, as you said, right, at some point you kind of age out of the process Correct. a little bit. But they still like to go out there. So he went out one night. And I'm coming down, and I'll say, I'll be damned if I'm going to do the Jello One arrival tonight. So I get to about the point where I think normally the uh, the, the ball's going to settle, and I add a little bit of power, and sure enough, it starts going down. So I go to burner, right? And this is in Hornet. Yeah. And all of a sudden, the ball like comes down and stops, and it starts racing up. I'm like, oh crap! Too much. So I pull it out of burner and give it a little Hornet DLC, you know, like a little <laughs> little wing wing. Yeah. Bam! Right into the three. And I uh, come to a stop. I'm like, all right, awesome. So I taxi. I do my thing. I'm in the ready room. XO comes in and goes. Joe, that was the most amazing pass I've ever seen. Oh, no. <laughs> so, <laughs> so the LSOs come in, and, you know, they're like, oh, 402, I yellow. And you're right, their heads all go down. Uh, and let's see if I can get this right. You can, you can uh, uh, critique <laughs> sure. me on this. Yeah, let's hear it. Over control, uh -huh. settle in close, low flat at the ramp, no grade three. That a boy. <laughs> see, paddles has got you. They know. <laughs> and the XO goes, what? <laughs> I saw it on the plat cam. It was beautiful. no. He was out there. Oh, he, he was, he was out on the. No, he wasn't waving. Well, he was but he just went out. On the, on the yeah, platform. he was hanging out. Oh. So that's how he saw it, the whole thing. And he was a paddle. And he was, so to my earlier question <laughs> about people who argue or whatever. Yeah. I was like, oh yeah, okay, whatever. Yeah, that checks and out. He, he fought it. He's like, what? That was the most amazing correction I've ever seen. <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> I wasn't uh, worried about top ten at that point. So. Yeah. Well, that's yeah, uh, yeah. I threw out the word plattles. That's what that's what we call people on the boat who just watch the plat cam. And, and the that's the TV in our yeah. ready rooms. Yeah, who think yeah. they can wave watching the TV, yeah. but then they forget the TV is not calibrated to anything. Ah, uh, right? yes, so. of course. Well, speaking of that, it's that's probably legendary. a good a segue as any. Hey, sure. Kevin, can you advance? I think the next one is just a gratuitous. I don't. When did you guys used to wear khakis? By the way, I don't probably know, but never. I'm kind of into it. I think I oh, see it. There's deck. an F14. They're in flight deck gear, so they got the white shirts on. Uh, okay. And the khaki All pants. right. I think I see it. Maybe a lot of black boots. What's going? Hey, I wore black boots my whole career. Sorry, man. All right, go to the next one, though, because, well, actually, that that, that box on the left, and here they are holding the pickle up like right. you talked about. Kevin, go to the next one for us. Is it the one I'm thinking of? Yeah. There it is. All right. So we get a repeater of some of this in the ready room, yep. but this is the equipment you guys are using. You don't have to necessarily uh, geek out on everything here, but give us an idea of what we're looking at. And again, I don't have the ability for you to, like, Monday night football draw arrows no, and okay. circles, so maybe it uh, looks like – Five display, uh, no six. So however you can describe what we yeah, got so here. Yeah, so this is called the LSODs. So what's that stand for? Uh, LSO landing dis signal officer display. Oh, all right. Zzz, plural, because <laughs> there's two of them right, all right there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. So if you look at it, they're both the same left and right. So if you look on the right one, that's where I hang out now. That's where your CAG paddles and your, you know, because they're generally paddles. not controlling or, or uh no that's just the senior back. also always stands on the right outsides okay. that's just our spot okay backup also which you got into earlier he'll be over there on the left but they're both the same displays really the ones that matter so the let's just start on the easier ones the bottom right screens on both those units mm -hmm. that's just how that's our touch screen of how to control radios okay so not only do we have all the frequencies to talk to the planes we also have direct phone lines to you know the captain of the ship the air boss the mini boss the cag a ready room if we need to call a ready room to get a rep so you can call anybody from that, which is pretty cool. The top left uh, screen is where we do a lot of our waving from. And when I say waving, obviously not glide slip, which we've been through. But you can see we have the repeater, the plat cam I was just talking to there. So just the traditional black and white footage looking down the L.A. with the crosshairs This there. is a camera embedded in the flight Embedded, deck. yeah. There's so it's two. right on centerline. Right on centerline the... looking straight back after shift. So that's why we use it for centerline because we know it's – built into centerline right. and what we actually do before we even start a recovery an lso will run out to centerline and he'll go out there and wave his hands around right. so we can make sure that's lined up and if it's not we know where centerline is because the human's standing on centerline because there are crosshairs on that display exactly and sometimes and they get thrown out of whack you know jet hits it just sure. right and it gets thrown out of yeah. whack just left and right just like any machines there's a lot of information on that screen, which we can really dive into, but the gist of it is that screen will tell us what the wind over the deck is, how fast the ship is going, make sure the lens is set correctly, and make sure that the arresting gear is set correctly the entire time. 
Okay. And then underneath that is more of our kind of just management screen. Um, so we got several different displays we can flip through there. We can get a more in-depth windscreen if we needed it. We usually keep it up on this thing called AdMax, which just has the list of names of who's on that recovery there for tracking purposes um, and stuff like that. But those ARBs I talked to, the emergency recovery bulletins, we can pull those up in there as well as opposed to using the big binder if we're in a pinch or something like that. So just some more different displays. But, yeah, we're hanging out here and we're watching this, and that's where that's the old L-Sides. Okay. And then the upper right quadrant, is that just your volume knobs? Yeah, and exactly. Just different... kind of control brightness, stuff like that. You okay. can control the uh, you control the foul deck status light. Um, and then for, for me, if I'm not having the – so I don't have the pickle in my hand, um, there's a wave off button there and a cut light button there. So I kind of leave my hand resting on, okay. on the wave off light button the entire time. You're like the overall big supervisor exactly. guy, so if you need yeah. something. All right, and then Kevin, go to the next one. I think this one should be our, what happened to our, did we not have one on the lens? Go one more. Thought we had one for the lens. All right, well, I guess yeah. not. Yeah. Um, so most of us have seen the lens. It's a row of vertical lights. Yep. You talked about this earlier, a row of green horizontal lights. Yep. And the idea is if the vertical light is aligned with the green lights, we're on glide slope. Exactly. And then you have the cut lights, you have the red wave off lights. My question to you is, what happens if we have some sort of casualty and that thing goes down? Or, uh, and you can maybe answer all of this in, in one go if you want, um, how does that keep up with if the ship is really heaving in some pretty heavy winds? Yeah, absolutely. Great question. Um, so ultimately, this thing is stabilized with gyros. So it has limits of how much uh, deck motion it can absorb mm -hmm. or outside of those limits, it's no longer accurate to the pilot. Our go-to backup uh, system there is called Movelis Manually Operated Visual Landing Aid System. I got that one for you. I, I wish you'd give me a it, chance. I think I had it, too. I got that one All right, for you. Good one. Good one. Um, so what Movelis was, is used for, we train to it quite often because we need to be good at it. It's a little bit different type of ball flying. So instead of trusting the lens and where the the ball is being projected based off glide slope mirrors, all that engineering talk like we talked about magic. before. Beep, bop, boop, <laughs> beep, bop, boop. It's just pure magic. It's just pure magic. Uh, it is, it is no kidding, just a stick that is over that we, we call it the lollipop because it's got a big dome on it and that's a stick that the controlling LSO is going to manually move that glide slope ball up and down to control the aircraft now. Times we use that exactly like you said, if we had a complete lens failure or those gyros fail, something fails within the, the iFLAWS lens, we will then go manual mode. Um, and we have multiple stations we can have this on the ship. We can have it right in front of the lens with, 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 where we want it. We can have it yep. in front of the lens or even in the bizarre, dreaded, never-before-seen Station 3 Movilis recovery. Over by the island. Over by the island on the right side, which is outside all of our habit patterns because <laughs> yeah. we're always used to looking on the left side of the L.A. Yeah. Um, and that's a whole other thing we train to where we train LSO. So to make it quick, if, if, you know, I'm controlling Movilis and I put the stick down, I show you a low ball. I'm telling you, you are low. I want you to add power to get higher. And then once the ball is now centered, I want them to reset their VSI and then go from there and fly our standard VSI and then vice versa, holding the ball high. Hey, yeah. man, increase your VSI, your high, and then go from there. So instead of where am I on glide slope? This is your way of telling me, in a sense, what you want me to do. Essentially. If you show me low, I might even, for whatever reason, be on glide slope, but you need right. me to add power. Maybe the deck's coming up. Yeah, maybe the deck's coming up. up. Right, yeah. Exactly. Deck's uh, coming up, and I just want you on a higher glide slope. Our normal or a little more slope. energized. Exactly. Yeah. Our, norm, our normal glide slope is three and a half degrees, but during pitch and deck, you know, go at the four, four mm -hmm. and a half if we need to. Where I just need to get you a little bit higher because the deck's coming up to meet you during pitch and deck, and then we're going to work you back down into the wires as the deck kind of settles yeah. back down. Yeah. And usually paddles is talking a lot more when we're doing a MOVOS recovery. Mm -hmm. You know, there will be a lot more paddles energy in terms of communication on those yeah. uh, as we're trying to move the aircraft around in the right spot. Yep. I was off the coast of Perth in 2005. I don't know if you saw that PBS carrier special, but I was on that deployment. Oh, I have. Yeah, and, and we had, <laughs> I have seen that. We had it's some gnarly. really heinous night. Yeah, I had a three pass uh, night where first pass missed everything, second pass touchdown but missed the wires. Third yeah. pass, I had to do a little uh, cobra maneuver, and drop the hook a little <laughs> Gosh, bit, but it grabbed imagine? it. And uh, as I've said on this show before, that was hard. The hardest part was taxing because now the 
adrenaline's coming out of my legs. Well, that and, too, and you're getting stuck on the upswing. And oh, yeah, you yeah. You don't want to throw in a bunch of power. Because then you're downhill. <laughs> yeah, and no, you're just kind of rolling around. Like, yep. I just want this thing chalked and chained. Oh, I need exactly. to get out of here yeah. and just go to bed. Yeah, but I'm no, over this. But no, but I walked into the ready room, and there was PBS with a camera like, hey, how was that? Hey, how you like, Can you sucked. talk to us about yeah, the exactly. worst night you've ever had laying on a boat? Like, it, no. It was, that is my go-to answer whenever someone yeah. says, what was your scariest uh, thing in an airplane? Yeah. All right, so – Really, all this, however long we've been talking, has been a like, – forget all that. It's all sure. been a lead up to this. <laughs> sure. Uh, jam by. Um, no, I mean, so, right, landing on a carrier, at least – I just – I don't know. I'm still kind of tripped out by this. To me, it was always the 1,000-pound elephant in the room. Like, mm-hmm. it's hard. It's, it's what distinguishes us from Air Force and everybody else. It's dangerous. And now along comes this magic carpet, I guess now we're calling it PLM. Yep. And we had an episode, 155, I want to say it was – um, I listened to it, I think, twice, and I'm, I'm still not sure I get it. And I'm not asking you to explain it. But the thing that just boggles my mind is, oh, yeah, now it's easy. Yeah, yeah. That elephant, yeah, he's gone. He's, he's dead. Uh, just put the thing on the thing and, and go. Yeah. Um, so, like I said, I'm not asking you to necessarily explain it. But from your point of view as a paddles, how is this changing the, the procedures, the top ten, I mean, I don't know, just, just freestyle on that a little bit. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a big topic. I'll do my best. Um, I'll say the elephant isn't completely gone. Maybe he's just sleeping. And I think that's what makes, from a waving standpoint, our job a little bit harder, wow. surprisingly. Okay. And the reason why I'll, I'll go in on this, now with PLM, which I'll talk to you exactly, I'll, I'll break it down for my blue-collar, simple-minded folk, and Thank hopefully you. that'll kind Maybe of Maybe I'll get it this time. It. Maybe you'll get it this time. I think I can do it. Um, but what it what it sees now from a waving is you see so many small deviations, right? You see so many okay passes over and over again. Even I've caught myself waving before where you either get stuck in this do loop of confidence or monotony and you miss the big settle out of nowhere. Hmm. And you and you're like, oh my and you're you know, you're late to give a power call, he's late or he or she's is late to kind of give you the power. Cause you just get comfortable. So from waving Yes, it's beautiful. GPA and boarding rates are skyrocketing. DQ rates from the FRS have decreased from 19% down to 4%. Wow. You know, it's incredible what this system has given us the ability to safely recover. Because at the end of the day, it's all we want. We want a safe recovery, safe and expeditious, like the book says, recovery around the boat. Um, but it can be a little bit challenging waving when you see 100 F-18s throw rails. And then finally, you know, you get a nugget or a new guy, or maybe there's some kind of mo- – there's, you know, maybe they're – not completely in PLM and they don't notice it and then we're late to notice it you know it's hard you you miss every now and then those kind of those big deviations so it recages my mind and I was like oh my gosh okay get it get out of that rhythm hmm. um PLM what is it it's got this yeah this is so funny I think I've had a hundred conversations in Reno at Tailhook with those straight deck Corsair pilots like <laughs> ah da, da, the magic <laughs> carpet you just put your hands up and you don't do anything uh dispel the rumor Magic Carpet, PLM, there is still pilot interface the entire time. It is not a coupled approach. It is not a hands-off approach. It is nothing. You are still actively flying the aircraft. What it does is back in the day in PA CAS, as we called it, you know, power approach mode, where we had to do 10 corrections to maybe move the jet twice. Now we're just doing one. So all it is in the most simplest of terms Auto throttles are engaged, so the jet is maintaining on speed for you, which was always a struggle, especially as you're moving glide slope around. And that's right? what finally fixed my Jello on arrival, by the way. Yeah, it was later on auto. when I used yeah, auto so throttles. We, yeah, so anyway. Yeah, before this, you know, we had guys that flew autos, um, which were which was kind of what led into this. What PLM does is boom, auto throttles engaged, we're on speed. Sweet. That's great news. Now it just <laughs> moves the flaps and the stabs, really. So the what it does is say you put the flaps full in the Rhino. It's going to throw them down. Some Boeing engineer is going to light me up. I should know this. Let's say 40 degrees is like locked out flaps full. With PLM engaged, all it does is just eats those flaps up a little bit into the 30s. So now your flaps full, but your PLM engaged. So let's say I want to make a power on correction. So I want to, I'm low, I get a power call from paddles, and I want to get back up to glide slope. All you're doing is pulling the stick back towards you. All the jet is now doing is digging the flaps into the other full gain. Make more lift. Make more lift, mm-hmm. right? More flappy, more lifty. Little leading edge love. Stabs work too. 
And then from there, as you then get back to glide slope, reset in your 600 to 700 feet per minute VSI, flaps go back to their neutral PLM setting and go from there. Vice versa, you're high, you're trying to work off a high, you're pushing the stick forward. Wing's gonna clean up a little bit, kill the lift, cool. I'm back on glide slope, back to center stick, Sweet, go back to their normal gains and they maintain that. Non-PLM, just to interrupt, mm -hmm. if, if you and I were out there and I'm in my trusty Hornet and you yep. tell me power and I go like this, Dunzo. bad things are going to happen. Bad things are going to happen. <laughs> yeah, so as we... So, so the old guys, I, I guess, is, to make my point, are probably the hardest ones to adapt to this, some maybe. Of, yeah, some of them can be. And, yeah. you know, there's, you know, onesie, twosies, hilarious, so they're probably going to crack up. They, like, refuse to fly. They're like, I don't need this PLM thing. So it's optional? I'm going to fly. No, it kind of was when we first started oh, wow. rolling it. Uh, it is full up PLM okay. required now. Okay. Um, so that's kind of the gist of how it works. Uh, and it's beautiful. You know, it kind of takes – I think we can all go back to early, you know, when you're in this job, to early naval aviation days where – you're flying off your lead, it's your first cruise, or it's your first comm to X or something, and you don't even know what you just did for the past hour, because the entire time you're like, oh God, I just, just got I just gotta get back to the boat and I gotta fly a good pass. Oh, yesterday yeah, I smoked yeah. days, right? You're just that's all you're thinking about. Uh, and you're super you're super focused. It has lowered the blood pressure, not only in the cockpit but on the platform for sure. And I think the statistics speak to it, uh, which is beautiful. But it can still be completely messed up. You can still mess it up. You can get it out of mode. The biggest one we see, which has always been my biggest fear with PLM initially, especially as we trained to it and implemented it, was someone who thinks they're in auto throttles, but they're not. So now as you get a power correction from paddles, kind of like you allude to, you're pulling the stick back. Flaps are going to dig, but if the motor spooled back, you're still going to fall out of the sky. Um, so that was always a worry. Um, you know, the power in the wires comment, the dreaded cut pass, you know, like we said, every time to this day with PLM, you still got to throw the power, the throttles forward when you're in the wire, just in case of the bolter, the hooks get wires snap, whatever scenario. Mm -hmm. Um, now that guys left hand are kind of detached, you know, when we went from moving this thing around all the time to just kind of letting it hover there and hang out on autos, you know, I've seen probably more cut passes out of senior ish guys than I have out of students. Wow. Because they're just like, all right, stop, boom. And the throttles are parked mid-range. Mm. I'm screaming, power back on. And then, you know, it's an automatic cut pass, which is the worst grade you can get. Uh, and it's an unsafe pass. You're usually, you know, you're talking to the man after you're, that one. You're talking sure. about your future as a naval you're talking, You know, you're talking yeah, to the man. I had um, one of those conversations once when I was a Nugget. Yeah, so that's kind, of, that's kind of the ins and outs of, you know, very simple how PLM works, okay. kind of from the waving perspective. Grades uh, was another one. Uh you got to get a little creative here for a while when we first implemented this. I mean, you, your top 10 ball flyers would be 4.0, 100% wow. for, ten, for 10 guys in an air wing. Which would have been amazing to have a line period like that normally. Right. You know, yeah, if you have a four, I mean, how often did you see a 4.0, 100% line period PA cast in Hornets? Like, I don't know, <laughs> maybe never, maybe one, I don't know. Um, and then you're kind of breaking down. It's like, all right, how do we break these guys apart? Um, we got rid of uh, – you know, number of passes kind of is how we kind of break them apart from there. But what we got to remember now is if we're talking about training in PLM, so everyone's flying PLM, um, which is great, really good. Uh, students, all their passes they do for the first pass. For a while, as we got into transition with PLM was coming online, we would still train F-18 students to manual FRSCQ ball flying then they would learn PLM in the fleet. Mm -hmm. Now they're doing it all up because we oh, because it's opposite. So, right. Yeah. yeah. So mm -hmm. now they're doing it all the time in the okay. F-18 Growler Lightning. Um, Hawkeyes are still ripping manual, flying the big rig around, <laughs> thousand corrections, but that's a whole different world to <laughs> yeah, me yeah. sometimes. Yeah. Um, so they're trained from day one with this system now. The grades speak for themselves, but I think if I had to put on my paddles, you know magic hat i think what we're tr starting to lose a little bit is kind of that seat of the pants feeling sometimes hmm. um you know younger generations are slower to recognize a underpowered aircraft or something like that Interesting. because they're put blind faith and i know i have before you put blind faith in the system like autos plm cool i'm chilling if, if, you, good. if you don't want to answer this you don't have to is that partly what happened with that f-35 in january of 22 yeah so we you know you, you've been in this seat before in the safety house. You know, we keep all that information kind of privileged. Yeah. Um, so 
I wish I can kind of dig into that. I'm sure the listeners are dying to hear from it. There's a multi- multitude of things, just like we learn from uh, mishaps and stuff like that, yeah, that that's lead to these scenarios. Yeah, no problem. Uh, but we kind of keep it in-house. Well, then I'll, I'll switch gears on you. Uh, sure. So when I was a new, again, F-18 pilot in the mid-90s, it was always, ooh, no, you, you have a HUD. Better turn it off once in a while to make sure you can still land <laughs> yeah, without it. And yeah. 700 and however many traps, I never had to land without a HUD. According to uh, OJ, who was our guest for the PLM, anything you can't land on the ship, and you tell me, uh, with Magic Carpet, you, or sorry, PLM, you can't land on the ship anyway. So yep. are we are we doing like the no HUD approach kind of thing? Yeah, or? yeah, we still train to it. So there's still okay. those goofy emergencies, right? The no HUDs, right? Uh, but it's PLM is still available. We got a major software update with the uh, with the F-18 and Growlers mainly, where PLM became we'll call it dual redundant, um, where a lot of emergencies couldn't hack it. But now with you know the list is long, but hide failures, major flight control surface failures, single engine, where all of that was not available to PLM is now available to our community in PLM, which has then led us down this road of being PLM all the time. Okay. So um, what I'm trying to get you to here, and and, uh, you don't have to make it up, but I mean, is top 10 stuff going to go away or is it here to stay? No, it's here to stay. Um, We, uh, you know, I'm sure you remember Bongo Bucks. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so Bongo Buck was, Paddle used to give everybody basically like, hey, man, here's your free Benny. Per line period. Per line period, yep. So here's your Bongo Buck. But you had to give it before you got your brief. Right, you had to give Uh, it before we read the grade. uh, If we read the grade, it didn't count. (laughs) So if you knew you flew a turd, and you would just kind of stand there to paddles and, you know, they'd give you the look and give them the bongo buck. It's an automatic upgrade yeah. to an oak, unless it was like a cup. I thought ours was like a no count. But anyway, yeah, yeah. there was always one else that would come in early, like, Joe, you got your buck? I'm like, dang it. Yeah, your boy from the squadron. You still, <laughs> yeah, got, huh? you still got your bongo. So we've kind of done little things like that where we get away from that or, you know, we incorporate interval more into the top 10 okay. since we're really serious on interval and stuff like that. Right. It's basically over to the CAG paddles in that air wing and the CAG to find ways to kind of break out guys yeah. more. But, yeah, it's still around. Is the E2 going to get something like this? Or conversely, uh, I have E2 friends, so I hope they'll take this in the spirit and it's intended. Sure. All you got to do is fly the thing, so you might as well <laughs> fly the dang thing. <laughs> yeah. What else you know? are you doing up there? <laughs> what kind of tactics does a Hawkeye do? Well, they're bringing stuff up to the front cockpit, but are they uh, are they getting anything, do you know, or is it going to be? Um, uh... Yeah, we actually just had our LSO conference back in a okay. few months ago talking about this. I believe it's called ILM. Yes, Hawkeye. The short answer is yes, Hawkeyes are getting some type of PLM equivalent okay. over time, uh, but it's very early in its stages. There's a lot of engineering and testing to be done. They have a model of it in a sim that seems like it's going to be somewhat helpful, mm. where they're trying to do the same thing. They're trying to manage or minimize the amount of inputs a pilot has to make to make a correction. Same kind of idea. Okay. So, which, yeah, if they go from a thousand down to eight hundred, that's still that's an improvement. That's pretty good, right? <laughs> I did I'll get a front that. seat ride uh, when I was CAG ops and a yeah. E two was pretty impressive. Yeah, I flew in the big girls yeah. CAG pilot field a uh, few times. It's cool. Very good. Um, but you you kind of alluded to this, but I'm thinking about when uh, we were at two thousand feet, not because we had done well, but that's where we were because uh, right. we were old Hornets in uh, CAG one when I was in Nugget. No gas with the Tomcats, because um, <laughs> they needed the extra maintenance time. But um, <laughs> there you go. But I guess the point being is PLM doesn't save you around the 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 case one pattern, which we don't right. have to necessarily drop anchor on. But that's in itself an art form. You have to enter at a certain spot. 100%. You got to see what's going on on the deck. Yeah. And coming down and breaking the deck is still fun. It used to be. Um, so there's a lot of that that I feel like is still we can still feel like naval aviators 100 percent. okay yeah yeah that's all still valid okay plm is plm's giving you love from the 180 or that three-quarter mile call the ball at night okay what about um and again uh, you know you, you speak for yourself here but as far as training command goes um i think we've already had right a class where they split some went to vt cq some didn't yeah sounds like the ones that didn't did okay uh where are we headed with because it Right, you tell me you were a CAC or a FRS, I guess, but VT yep. as well. You've got a. We used to have a training carrier, don't anymore. So you got to work in with someone else's. Absolutely, it's a big footprint and yeah. big risk. So yeah, it's big risk. You know, everything's time and money, right? In our world, you know, at the end of the day, Navy is a business, so we got to kind of look at that as so a they kind say, of thing. Yeah, so they say, yeah. right? I don't know. It's all funny money to yeah. me. It's all imaginary. Um, but yes, yeah, so Sinatra CQ. Um, with event, eventually, we know the T forty five is going to time out. You know, the writing's on the wall. You, yeah. Airplanes and airplanes been everything around does, for so yeah. long; everything mm-hmm. does, right? The question is, what do we do next from there? What kind of airplane are we looking at? What kind of capabilities do we want? That's all ongoing and kind of my big 
big uh, project right now is Force Paddles here, is gathering that data to then present to the uh, the graybeards and see what they say. Um, yes, we have we have a couple of students that have uh, non done not done T forty five CQ went straight to the FRS and have been successful, uh, but we still have a couple that have not, uh, and we're kind of in the process right now of gathering all that information and seeing where it's going to go. Honestly, because mm -hmm. uh, we're seeing you know all kinds of different little areas where there might be you know deck procedures are kind of goofy, right? First time tax around a flight deck is in a Hornet now versus a Goshawk, stuff like that. So. It is in its infant data collection stage to see where the future of tailhook aviation will go specific to the training command. Okay. Got it. Yeah. All right. Let's move on to – actually, hold on. I got one more question. Um, Harriers and now, I guess, F-35Bs, they land on different kinds of ships, different kinds of landings. Do they have LSO equivalents? Do you know? They do. Gosh, they do what they are or who they are. I have no clue. Right. Um, we'll save that for another day. Yeah, we don't train to them. I've never interacted with them. I think it's just a squadron rep who's more just there for safety, more for like gear down, deck clear, stuff like that. Not as much involved as we are in the tailhook world. Cool. All right. Well, then next I want to pivot to some listener questions. These are from Let's folks who it. provide uh, support to the show. Yeah. And they get to hear that I'm going to meet with you, and then uh, they submit their questions. Yeah. Uh, Tom Oates wants to know, the LSO platform always seems jam-packed. What's everyone's job? I think we pretty much covered that one. And we'll make these yeah. questions like a lightning round. So. Yeah, yeah, we hit most of those. Like we said, uh, it's a combination of guys training, guys leading. You know, about okay. six to nine guys on the platform. Unless it's FRSCQ, then, <laughs> then it, it feels like sometimes there's 20 of us up right. there. But that's because each squadron is out there representing their guys, waving their guys so that they hear the students you're familiar you're right. with. Okay. So that's where it kind of, no problem. you can see those pictures of a bunch. Yeah, no problem. All right, Harrison Wells, is LSO a highly sought after position? Uh, I would say so, yeah. yeah. I think you're a, you know, you're a young junior JO and you probably look up to him. Yeah. I would absolutely, yeah. it's a good career progression yep. position as well. Like I said, I didn't try. And of course people say, oh yeah, they, you know, you tried and they didn't let you. <laughs> uh, but I did have a friend in my squadron who tried and didn't uh, make it. And he was yeah. disappointed, but it's, yeah. it's not for everyone. All right, Scott Morris, does PLM relegate the Jell-O-1 arrival to history? So I don't know if you can answer that per se, but I guess it sounds to me like it's it's way more consistent on the three. Is that basically true? It is. If you're flying, I'm sure you'd still find a way to tag the ace for the boys. Uh, but I'd it click has, out. Just <laughs> yeah, you probably would. But it has significantly reduced what okay. we see in the one wires yeah. for sure. Does I mean maybe this is too far off script? Does that change anyone's idea? Like each of these wires is a bunch of equipment, a bunch of people, a bunch of a cost. Sure. Are we talking about maybe going down to fewer wires in the future? I don't think we're going to change the structure of the boat. What it does allow us to do is out as these wires time out, maybe a little bit faster. We can strip them. The LSOs can change the targeting with more comfort uh. of having control of the aircraft. You know, if I'm now going to target on or on top of the two where before I'd be like, okay, that's pretty low hook to ramp. Uh, I can do that a little more confidently. I just know I'm going to have to probably interact more yeah. with the aviator as they get in close. And interestingly, right, you just say, oh, we're going to target. And for anyone else, I mean, there's so much involved in that because now the lens angle is changing. Yep. Your eye is changing because yep. what was on glide slip before Correct. might be high. Correct. So there's a whole lot to that. But uh, yeah. <laughs> let's, let's save that for part two. Part two All sure. right. Uh, Joe Kunzler, in the era of PLM, is there still a need for naval outline fields, and if so, why? So hold on, I gotta set this up. Joe is a great friend of the show. Okay. He's up in Coop, uh, uh, in the Pacific Northwest, Coopville? fighting very hard for Coopville. <laughs> he is like the the Coopville saint. Yeah. He goes to all the hearings, and uh, he has a big heart for that place. Okay. And good. the need for FCLP, but I guess I'll put it to you this way: if it's, dare I say, easier. Uh, do you find is there as much requirement for FCLP? If we were going to the ship for the first time in a long time, yep. I feel like we spent the last two weeks before we went to the ship just right. doing that. We have reduced with PLM. We have reduced overall the squadron's amount and the student's amount of FCLPs required to go to the ship. So it's by it's down by like 30, 40 percent less than wow. what we used to do without PLM. But yes, ultimately, to answer your question, we would still need outlying fields, especially for places like Whidbey that have noise abatement and a, and a non-standard pattern, which is really bad for students that are doing this first time. You know, you're flying this goofy pork chop pattern. At Whidbey. Yeah. And but then you can go to Coopville. You can go to Coopville and fly somewhat of a normal pattern. Right. So we need that for the training ability okay. long term, for sure. I think he's going to send you a, a contribution for that. I would he, hope he so. Can, uh, he can cut that they and say, look. Like, yeah. His, uh, his neighbors don't like jet noise yeah, up there. Good stuff. <laughs> All right. Nathan 
Nathaniel Gardner says, how much control does an LSO have during emergency situations? Are they working in coordination with the teams navigating the ship and controlling airspace or giving direction, direction to those groups to get the best possible outcome? Awesome question. Uh, we kind of talked about emergencies before, the in-depth process, and just on the platform. To answer your question, I would say LSOs are some of the most powerful lieutenants in the Navy. And the reason I say that, not just because I love all, LS, all things LSO, a CAG paddles has a direct line to the captain of the ship and the commander of the air wing, where if there's an emergency or they need something, you know, they need winds here or we need to point here. You're, I mean, I call the captain directly. He's like, Captain, I need this. Roger that paddles every time. The same thing with CAG. So being a lieutenant and kind of having that relationship, I mean, it's incredible. It's kind of, it's yeah. very humbling in general. But yeah, uh, anything we need, we get. Obviously, they know you don't abuse it and call them right. when it's not needed. But yeah. point is, again, like, Captain, I need, I need. Uh, can we get some plates? Down can we get some plates over here on the platform? <laughs> right. You know, but like, the point is, it's the safe and expeditious <laughs> recovery of aircraft. Yep. These are people's lives. These Correct. are expensive airplanes. Correct. And this is, by the way, the very force that we're there to project. Yep. If we put one in the drink, it's uh, not, avail look too good. not available so to whatever us. Whatever we need, we get. All so right. that's pretty cool. All right. Uh, John Clark, how are sugar calls? Now, you talked about advisory and informative and imperative, so mm -hmm. over to you to interpret John's question here. All right, let's see. How are sugar calls communicated or conveyed to an aviator who's, quote, in the barrel around the boat during come-out landing operations? Oh, man, that's a good one. Um, sugar calls, what he means by that, and you kind of see this with either a struggling guy on cruise or a student. Um, so let's talk about non-come-out real quick. There's been tons of times, that's another part of our job, you're talking to a guy that's on the downwind or up in the stack, and you just give him a little pep talk, just like a third base coach of a little league mm -hmm. game. You know what I mean? It's like, come on now, kid. Get back in the box, you know, whatever you're going to say. At the end of the day, whether whatever calm out type of recovery we're doing, if it is going to directly affect getting that jet on board safely and keeping everybody alive, we're going to talk, no matter what. Um, so we'll probably talk a little bit less, but we still, you know, power calls are always going to be there. Yeah. Wave off calls are always going to be there. Yeah. Gary Frey wants to know, are NFOs ever LSOs or just pilots? <laughs> just pilots. I'll keep that one short. Okay. Sounds good. Uh, Tom Johnson, how does the ethos of pilot taking their score like a man get instilled? And so again, I assume this is, you know, getting, Debrief. Paddles, paddles train life. Yeah. 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 And I will say from my experience, um, it was, again, the culture of our squadron was, yeah. hey, look, you're going to stand up and you're not going to argue, right. especially as a young person later. Yeah, maybe, but not really even then. Yeah. And I think that, I mean, I remember being a, a Sinatra student and anytime you got your debrief, you know, you're standing up, you're looking them in the eyes, you're not talking back. And that's kind of instilled on you when you're a, long, a young Lieutenant JG. Mm -hmm. And as you get senior and you do this for longer, I think you have to remind yourself that sometimes because everyone's watching you. Young kids are watching you and stuff. It's like, all right, just take it on the chin yeah. and then wait for them to get out of the room and then you can have your colorful commentary yeah. after. But that's just us. That's just naval aviation. Yeah. Well, and I had fantastic COs and XOs and CAGs who would – you know, they might sneak out of, eh, it's not what I thought saw, but thank you. Yeah. But generally, they just say, thanks, yep. and just be done with it. Yeah, it's uh, just our culture, yeah. which I love. Yep. All right, Roland M. Germain, German, sorry if I pronounce that incorrectly, Roland, the third. Uh, how does one qualify as an LSO, purely based on number of OK passes and recommendations <laughs> from Squadron Skipper or some additional criteria? We've covered a lot of that, but yeah. talk about, like, you know, if a young person, the, if the squadron has a need for one, maybe it's not all OKs, but does the performance sort of factor into whether you're going it to? It does. I think I kind of lose that, too. Yeah. You know, I'm not going to recommend ever a nomination, a dude that's the, the bottom of his squadron to then become an LSO. I don't think that's a good precedent to send unless you see an improving trend. Maybe he really wants to be an LSO, he or she, sorry. Uh, and then over time, you know, it's like, hey, I need you to work on this. And then their next line period, they crush it. Mm -hmm. Like, all right, cool. Yeah. So we can, you're teachable, you can train, good to go. Yeah. But I'm not counting OKs and stuff like that. The okay. squadron, it, yes, your squadron commander ultimately does have to approve you being nominated, though. And there is a question, and I think we still have a handful of these left, about being an LSO, how that affects your ball flying. So we'll get to that in a second. Bruce Beaker Thomas, from an Air Force pilot, what qualifications are used to get an LSO rating? Min traps, cruises, et cetera. 
uh, and do LSOs still fly or is it a dreaded non-flying cruise? I think we talked about the first part of that. Yep. And I think we sort of talked about the second part. But the second part is you're in the squadron. Yep. You just take a day. Maybe you don't fly that whole day. Generally, right. you try not to. Correct. And that's your wave day. Yeah, so you're still absolutely flying. It's basically when you're a squadron LSO, that's just a duty day for you. So you're out of the rotation usually that day unless whatever circumstances. And then when you're at CAG Paddles, since you work as in the you know for the air wing, you're flying – whatever squadron is going to give you a jet that day on the line. So flying across, up and down, you know, three or four different F-18 squadrons. So, yeah, absolutely still flying the entire time. It's not just boat stuff only. All right, so this next one then is uh, – it's it's a it's kind of a harder one, I would say. Okay, uh, it's from Jim see. Gundog, who says, LSOs are human and make mistakes, even to the point of being directly involved to some pretty tragic accidents due to foul decks. Even more recently of the F-35C due to the break that he did – how do LSO teams and air wing leadership reconcile these decisions? So first off, let's not talk about the F-35 because I already brought that up. Secondly, let's acknowledge that there was, I believe, I forget how many years back, but a pretty heinous, I guess, for lack of a better word, uh, collision between, uh, it was a Prowler on an S-3 the one with the in the landing area. The yeah. And uh, a lot of guys were killed. And yep. uh, I'm not going to necessarily say what it was attributable to because I don't know, but I think I've heard it was attributable to a foul deck uh, miscall or something. Correct. Uh, but to uh, uh, Jim's point, LSOs are human. How do LSO teams and air wing leadership reconcile these decisions? Yeah, gosh, Jim, that's a tough one. Um, We're going to need more beer for that. Yeah. <laughs> Buzzkill. <laughs> Way to bring the mood down. Um, good question, though. Uh, yes, you are correct. We are still all human yeah. at the end of the day. So perfection, we can always just fight for it every single day and every single recovery. Um, how do you reconcile it? Depending on the you know situation dependent, you can talk your way through a different thousand situations. Um, this is why, you know, you, you know I'm going to tie this to the LSO school. We have, an, we have a dedicated day at the LSO school where we watch mishaps. It's kind of a weird day, but we do have a lot more beer as we're watching them to kind of get us through it because it's dark. Okay. We watch hours and hours of mishaps and things we have done wrong in naval aviation from the 80s until the most recent one. And you learn so much as an LSO from doing that. And, you know, kind of in the back of your mind, it's like, oh, man, I never want to be that guy. So we train to it just like we do anything. And we do it and we take it really seriously. And there's a level of professionalism. I mean, Correct. if you're out there saving my bacon and something happens to me and you have some part of that, you're not going to sleep well that night. No. Or for a lot of nights. Yeah. So, so yeah. Train, train, train. Yep. And be the best you can. All right. Nigel Creel, with all the technology available today, parentheses, noise canceling headphones, boom mics, etc., we always see LSO images of people on telephone handsets, and we did today. Yeah. Tradition or functional considerations? And I have a caveat to that question. Remind me of it. Anyway. Sure. But you did say you wear a headset. Yeah, so the uh, the yeah we wear a one piece uh, headset. Uh, okay. So just one of my ears is exposed. At the end of the day, the you know this is always kind of pops up. It's like why aren't LSOs and cranials like the rest? That of the was going to be my follow up. Right, that's always kind of a question. <laughs> the reason why field of view and sound is really important. You know, it, I, when you fly, when I still fly, we wear double hearing protection. You know, earplugs, EPs, whatever, and then a helmet. Right. On the platform, we just wear earplugs. Um, and the reason for this, even with PLM, there's a lot you can understand and know on the energy state of an aircraft based off sound, which I think is very important. And not only the aircraft waving, you can also hear maybe something from another LSO, maybe someone mm. out on the flight deck screaming foul deck for some reason, which oh, wow. if you had double hearing protection, that would be muffled. I mean, I've even heard times before where, you know, the deck is clear and I hear an arresting wire do the, you know, getting pulled back and going thump, thump. And I do a quick look, look over, and the gear's out of battery. Cool, foul deck wave off. And I probably wouldn't have heard that if I was wearing a bunch of hearing protection and stuff like that. Yeah. And then same same thing with the field of view. You know, we want to be able to see everything. Uh, standard combat issue paddles, sweet sunglasses, sunscreen, uh, mustache, float coat. float coat. Mustache is is desire, yeah, not we required. we have female uh, LSOs. And they'll put on fake mustaches, which is <laughs> one of the funniest things. It gets a good laugh out of me. Good. You get a female LSO, she walks up, you know, everyone's got cruise mustaches, and she comes up with a fake one on. It's nice. awesome. But, Outstanding. Um, that's why that's there. And also, we need to – it's so loud. There's always a jet. Usually it seems like it's turning behind us, a helicopter spin on the other side. 
and we need to be able to safely talk to each other if something's wrong to be able to explain the past or if there's an emergency. So that's yeah. why we limit the headgear over there. Yeah. I've done some breakdown videos on my YouTube channel in the past, and invariably you get maybe some crusty old deckhand like, oh, they ought to be wearing cranials. Yeah. And, um, you know, I don't want to say it's ignorance, but it kind of is because for all the reasons, you, you know, they haven't they haven't walked a mile in your shoes. Correct. All right. Jorge Martinez, how do LSOs translate the expertise of landing a plane, i.e. the first person view, I think this is the one I was thinking about, mm -hmm. to the ability to judge an aircraft's energy state from outside the cockpit, i.e. third person's view? But actually, he's asking from the first person to the third. I'd like to ask you the opposite of that, but you can take either one of those. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think, and it goes kind of to the other question, do LSOs fly? Yes, we all still fly. Right. And what's so important about that is it allows you to understand exactly what they're going through because we've all had dark nights we've all had adverse weather conditions we've all had emergencies at some point so to be able to put your at i always whenever something non-standard is going on i always try to put myself in that cockpit what are they experiencing okay i know i've seen this before maybe i can help them troubleshoot it with something i remember and things like that um and then you know when you're flying we're still flying the rules to live by we're still flying our numbers and really being a paddles and a pilot at the same time, you just want to make sure you're, you don't get lazy because you want to be the example. You want to fly those nice passes. You don't want to make a big mistake, power in the wires, and you cut a dude out of the pattern, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So it just makes you harder on yourself, I guess, from that perspective. Yeah. Do you think standing on the platform and watching landings makes you a better ball flyer? I think it does. Because yeah. uh, you've kind of seen the mistakes. And maybe, honestly, or? where it makes you better is, like we talked about earlier, is the case one stack. Watching how the stack collapses, watching the intervals. It's like, okay, well, that guy turned on that interval there and he cut him out. So, you know, you learn so much just from standing there and absorbing that beautiful artwork that is the case one landing mm -hmm. pattern. Mm -hmm. Probably you know, a little different too. if you're out there in the rain and uh, everything yeah, else. Yeah, then, uh, then I'm so <laughs> over it. I'm like, I'm so tired of being a paddles right now. Oh, uh, dear. <laughs> well, speaking of that, Nick Forster, how do LSOs adapt to night ops when you lose so many visual cues? I've seen the low-light TV footage of the jet's position relative to a set of crosshairs, which yeah. we talked about. Yeah. But I imagine there are many more parameters your brain processes when watching an approach in daylight that are unavailable at night. And so to his point, we talked about the young person coming out there in the daytime. You've got the horizon yep. and there's a certain amount of distance, you know, between and you start to get it used to where roughly glide slope is at night, particularly dark nights when we tend to fly. Right. We always right. pull in when the moon's up <laughs> uh, and pull into port. That is. Yeah. Um, what do you do then? Yeah. Awesome question. Um, so from the training side, I don't even let a brand new LSO who's, let's say he's day primary. We literally have day and night broken down in training oh, wow. where you have to complete all the day training before you start waving at night because it is that much different. Uh, yeah, the cues can get really hard, uh, but we still go back to the fundamentals of grabbing the wire, hook point as best as you can, right? Especially on those super dark nights. Mm -hmm. And we'll use other tools available to us to try to build some kind of horizon. Because if we can have some kind of horizon there on that dark night, then we can have a way to kind of know where the aircraft is. And also we're gonna listen to them as they're shooting the approach. So as that aircraft is flying the approach, you know, if they're flying a nice one, you should hear, you know, 303, you're on course, you're on glide slope, three quarter mile, call mm. the ball. Now it's like, all right, cool. They're calling them on and on. He's seen on and on. Cool. That's where that piece of sky is. But going back to the, uh, we call them HRUs, Horizon Reference Units. Usually what we try to do is, is put another ship back there in the strike group about three miles behind the carrier and have them turn a couple lights on on their mast. Hmm. And so now we know, okay, there's our HRU. That's a ship sitting back there. It's roughly on the horizon. Now we can kind of build that eyeball cowl high and low based off where we know relatively the horizon is. And then your eyes adjust pretty well. Surprisingly, you'd be yeah. surprised. You know, we keep everything dark out there. We know bright lights. And once the eyes get set, even on those dark nights, you can still you can still kind of build it up. And that ship can double as plane guard, I guess we call it, right? Yeah, so exactly. if the helicopter, for whatever reason, can't get somebody out of the drink, they, exactly. can, they can help us out yeah, as well. Yeah, so a couple tools we use to right. think outside the box. Dutch Wood wants to know, have you ever had to jump into the net to avoid a near mishap at the ramp? I think you call it the mitt, right? Called that the little, mitt, yeah. Yeah, well, first off, explain what it is and then tell us if you've ever had to use it. Yeah, so uh, <laughs> off to the right, if you guys remember the picture from before. So basically off to the right of the platform for where further the paddles port. are standing. Yeah. <laughs> So the yeah, it's further here we go with the boat terms, man. Port. I wasn't even an academy guy. Uh, anyway. <laughs> Thank anyway. you. Anyways, uh, yeah. So it's off to our basically my right sh shoulder. So as 
As we're watching Jets land. Mm-hmm. We all go right if we need to. I personally have never jumped into the thing for like an actual emergency. Um, I have as a kind of a good CAG paddles. I have timed my entire LSO team for CAG. I brought CAG up there uh, as a joke one day to try to see how fast I can get seven LSOs into the net to impress CAG. They thought it was a real thing. Uh, a timed evolution that we had to pass for an evaluation, so they took it very seriously. It was just a practical joke the entire time. So, uh, But we do have an awesome tradition. Oh, thank God I remember this. The first time that you wave, uh, actively wave and participate as an LSO on primary, we have a tradition of throwing that LSO into the net as kind of a, you know, welcome aboard. You you finally controlled your first aircraft mm. of the paddles. So. Well, I would have to think jumping into that as part of the – PQS, as we would call it, right? Yeah. Personnel qualification stand, so that you know if you ever had to do it, 100%. what it feels like. And so it's yeah. it's it's pretty. It's all training. Is it forgiving? I mean, it doesn't. You don't get. Oh God! It's, every boat's a little different. Okay. One one is like just a nice pillow, and the other one's jumping onto plywood. Ouch! <laughs> it's weird yeah. sometimes, depending on you know what yeah. it is. But on that note, and again, I don't mean to push the issue. So <laughs> if you true. want to avoid it, you can. Well, I'm sure. going to get serious again. Um, that F-35 that you don't want to talk about, and mm-hmm. I don't blame you. Uh, but some LSOs did get hurt. I mean, um, sometimes you don't have a chance. It just Correct. things happen so fast. Yep. Um, I don't know if you're willing to say anything about that, but uh, I understand somebody was pretty seriously hurt. Yeah. Um, you know, not to speak to that one specifically, but it's not the first time a paddles has been hit okay. with a piece of metal uh, from a jet hit in the back of the boat. Um so this, the risk is there, right? And we try to mitigate it as much as possible, uh, limiting bodies up there, getting people the right training and stuff like that, and just really limit it by keep people off. You know, our, our ODU is off the ramp, off the foul deck. Keep yeah. them off the ramp and off the foul deck. Yeah. So, yeah. but Well, don't they still pay you uh, flight deck pay? So that's oh, supposed to yeah. Be, so, that makes up for $100 oh, a totally month. totally makes up for it. Yeah, yeah, yeah well, what a deal, I'll hit you with a piece right? of metal. You got your... I'll get the next beer from my <laughs> flight deck pay. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> All right. Uh, two more. Stefan Cote, does having experience as an LSO change the way you perceive fly your landings on the boat? I think we covered that one. Yeah. All right. Last one. Aaron H., what's the worst weather he's had to deal with on the platform? Now, we talked about night where, okay, we need to put that uh, HRU, I think you called it, yep. uh, out there. And I've seen that as well. But um, that doesn't necessarily help you if we're in a sandstorm or a fog bank or yeah, no, it sure doesn't. It's driving rain. It so. sure doesn't. All right, give us give us one good sea story. Oh then. man, and I mean that's always yeah. I've, I've seen a tons of these. You know, it's always those ones, and I'll try to break it down from you so you can kind of feel like you're in the jet with this person. So we're usually doing a strain at that point. Let's say it's daytime, bad weather. Okay. You get the dreaded drop off, three quarter mile call the ball. I'm sure you've had a pass like this. And you look outside, you're like, bro, ain't nothing there. Uh, so that's where, you know, we go back to paddles terminology. We train the pilots. If they can't, even if it isn't bad weather, maybe the lens isn't on or the lens is getting blocked. If they can't see the ball, first thing that pilot's going to say is Clara. Clara is the aviator telling the LSO, I cannot see anything. And then from there, we'll initiate a paddles talk down and we'll start basically talking to them right away, their glide slope position and their center line control. Now, this is where it gets weird. This is where, let's say they can't see it, but I can't really see all of that aircraft or see that aircraft completely at all. I'll give out a continue call and they're going to fly it down to a certain weather minimum. And I'm just literally scanning left and right in this fog bank to try to pick them out. And another tool we'll use, we'll go 99 taxi lights on. I've had that. Yep. Nine, that's the worst, right? If you're flying, yes. you hear, you hear <laughs> CAC paddles come by like, hey, 99, this is CAC paddles. Yeah, we're going taxi lights on. Now you're like, oh my gosh, what am I getting myself into? Uh, what that does is I can see that thing pretty blatantly a lot quicker than just a gray aircraft in a gray fog bank or with rain and wind and all this chaos. Tax lights on, cool. I've watched a couple of that. I, I'll usually grab CAG paddles. We'll grab them. The senior LSO will grab them at that point. Start talking to them, initiating a talk down. And then as the aircraft hopefully breaks out, we got them in a, in a spot of the sky where we can continue to talk to them. Hopefully they can break out the lens in the center line at some point and we can safely recover them. If we can't, cool. Wave them off. Try again. Yeah. Okay, so I have multiple things in my head here i don't want to forget <laughs> all of them if i can help it uh but i will say i had 
99 taxi lights on one night. And the, that, that was okay, <laughs> except it illuminated the fog in front of me. Right. But then at some point, they decided they wanted me to turn it off. I'm like, oh, you know, because it's not a hotel. <laughs> yeah. so I'm like yeah. trying to find the thing, and I'm all over the place. <laughs> uh, but they took it easy on me. And I guess we didn't really talk about that. But when when circumstances are a little crazy, right. um, grades sort of go out at Absolutely. that point. Let's get everybody down. Let's get everybody safe. And, uh, Bad yeah, weather, big yeah, emergencies on something, jets. Something crazy. Yeah. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention was on the Clara, if I call Clara to you, you assume I don't see anything. Correct. Uh, at certain times of day, certain ships after a while, the non-skid gets worn off with the paint of the center line oh, or yeah. the sun at an angle. If it rained, yep. I might say to you, Clara, line up. Yep. And that tells you, okay, I see the ball, but I'm not really sure where I am. Where I am on center And so line. now the backup also, I think if I remember correctly, Correct. might say, you're on center line. Or right. uh, you're lined up a little right or yep. whatever. Exactly. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And then the third one, what was the third one? See, I knew I'd forget. Um, but uh, all right, I'll come back to it. Um, but how do you, um, as far as, the, so that's weather. Oh, that's what it was. Um, the ship, I always wondered this, right? Uh, like if I fly my F-18 to Lemoore, mm -hmm. my minimums are 200 and a half. Yep. Um, and that means I need to have an overcast ceiling no lower than 200 feet above the ground. And I need to be able to see a half a mile. Now, I don't know, you tell me, but this is my impression. We have that at the ship, but we always ignore it. Yeah. <laughs> I've been both part of and heard of some, yeah, keep it coming. Because yeah. I can see something that tells me I think I know where you are. Right. And then lo and behold, you end up with a close pass by the island or something else happens or if the ship's turning or there's drift. Um, I, I'm not looking to put you or any other LSOs on report. But sure. right in the end, if my option is land on the ship or, you know, if I have a divert, great. A lot of times I don't. Oh. Uh, so I, I don't know. Talk to me about the 200 and a half. Yeah, that, that, that's where I was going to go for this. Let's talk okay. about like FRSCQ. You know, we have a lot of handcuffs. We won't play with the weather. But you're close to Miramar. But you're close to Miramar. Or or we can send the jets back yeah. to North Island, let them sit, wait it out at night, right. stuff like that. So we don't tend to see this type of waving. Where you see this waving is always the worst case scenario. Your blue water, which means you have no divert available. Jets must land on ship. There's, you know, we can't tanker drag you anywhere. We can't do anything. Um, and it always seems to be you launch clear weather and then mom, we call the boat mom, mom right. finds the weather and she just strolls straight into that thing. And now everyone's like paddles. What are we doing? It's like, I'm not driving this thing. I'm just trying to get you aboard. Yeah. Um, so that's usually when we will, by me saying continue or paddles contact, we are now specifically paddles contact. We are now accepting going through those weather minimums for me to talk to you to recover on the air okay. on, the, on the carrier. Now, one of the ways you know if I am on speed or not, particularly at night, is we have an approach indexer or it's approach lights, I guess. Yeah. Uh, and it's like a stoplight, only I guess upside down. Yep. Uh, anyway, point I'm trying to get to: if I have my taxi light on. Um, and, and I'm alluding to the point that it's not the only reference. Mm -hmm. how, how do you know the attitude of my airplane? Maybe with PLM, yeah. it's not so hard anymore. It sounds like it's mostly on speed, but in the old yep. days, it wasn't. Yeah, so uh, we trained to different site pictures of basically aircraft orientation. Um, and at nighttime, you know, there's gouge for every different type of aircraft. Because there's all those lights on. Ba yeah, based on their yeah. mainly like the wingtip lights and the tail light and stuff like that. So, you know, if you're seeing so much of this or not enough of that, you can assume the nose position of the aircraft okay. from there without seeing those indexers. Yeah. yeah. I might have uh, accidentally turned off my lights one night flying by a cruise ship. And then, um, <laughs> and then, well, my, my afterburner lights were on. Those uh, ones always work. But then, well, they should, uh, right? but then forgot to turn them back on oh, for my arrival so <laughs> they had a, a orange light i'd like to hope was the on speed the whole way down but not much else <clears throat> anyway uh not yeah the first, not and, the I've, last, my and, friend. and i've had my night in the barrel when i was a nugget i did uh, three <laughs> bolters went and got gas two wave offs uh, -huh. uh the good thing about that was i decided to do that when we were off the coast of my hometown i was Living. Oh, so you're begging for the divert to go home. Well, I was living in sin at the time. So <laughs> okay. I got home. Uh, I'll skip any more details. But the <laughs> next day I came back out and I brought Taco Bell to everybody in the newspaper because we'd been at sea that for... Is such, that is such... Maybe the most important thing you've said this whole interview. If you <laughs> diver and you don't bring... Your squadron and paddles, like burritos or something back to the ship, you're not hearing the end of it yeah, for a while. Yeah, That's a, yeah. I mean, that should be part of all naval aviation training. The yeah. trend is dying a little bit, so yeah. fix yourselves. All right, so we're wrapping up here, uh, Jamboy. This is good stuff. I mean, <laughs> yeah. what, I mean, obviously we could go on and on. Oh, yeah, but, all day. So with PLM, I sort of already tried to hint at this, but I think I know the answer. What's the future for LSOs? It doesn't sound to me like they're going away. Yeah, definitely not going away. Um, 
I think the conversations popped up from some good idea fairy over and over again. Uh, but I think we have proved with recent mishaps and continued scary passes and stuff like that, that you never know what's going to happen and they're going to keep happening. You know, this is not a completely fail safe thing. So yeah. it is absolutely required that we continue to train and man LSOs and continue to do so for the future of naval aviation. So for example, in my industry, uh, oh, we have two pilots and uh, of course the union wants to keep it that way, but maybe for logistics, we could go down to one pilot. Sure. Could maybe, I don't know if there's any gain in this, but instead of four or five or six people out there, maybe you could do it with just two with the right technology or something. Yeah, or that... yeah. we're always looking to trim numbers and stuff like that, you know, continuing conversations of manning, just really manning in general in the Navy as we move on so we'll just kind of see there's options to go that way for sure okay. but time will tell yeah how about the future for you i mean you're still active duty right lieutenant commander so you're at what 14 15 uh how gosh you're years? 11 you're 11 12 oh, next man. year yeah just look so. older sorry yeah this is a mustache <laughs> mustache adds 10 years who wants a mustache right? <laughs> yeah there you uh, go so uh what's the future for you you're gonna keep playing the game i mean at some point you're gonna not be able to hang your identity on being sure. an lso anymore sure i know it's gonna be a crisis for me uh, i got one more year in the seat as force paddles so i'm very excited about that okay uh it buys me another year living in coronado instead of beautiful lamore which is pretty nice turns out you're just a couple blocks away so we yeah, need to i know get together and do maybe little club and... after this Ooh, who knows all right. um but yeah, no, I uh, recently got into the reserves of VFA 122, so I'm gonna go uh, be a be a dirty uh, part timer for a bit, okay, and do that life, and then look for some opportunities back around the hometown. All right, so I'm excited. Well, I'm gonna go out on top with the uh, with the flow coat on. Oh, fantastic! Well, yeah. good. Maybe someday we'll have the, uh, although not for the wrong reason, we'll have the uh, Joe Kirksey uh, mixer. Yeah. The, uh, because, because you were just that much of a legend. Yeah. Oh, yeah. well, that's a very humbling word to be used. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for that. Though. Well, speaking of that name, yeah. how did somebody come up with a call sign Jamboy? Now, you know uh, we've had a Jambo on this stress. show. Jambo, uh, you say. Jambo. He was uh, an early Top Gun instructor, and uh, he, he earned that uh, with some shenanigans, and uh, I want to say, was it... Um, Jamaica, uh -huh. trying to steal a cab. Alcohol might have been involved. Uh, it never but, is. No, right? no, no. <laughs> well, it was on our interview. Just one, though. I'll take it better <laughs> next time. But I'm out. Dig it. Um, but, yeah, how'd somebody come up with Jambo? Oh, food? gosh. The, uh, the unrated version is obviously not appropriate for this podcast, as right. is tradition uh, you, yeah. in our thing. The, uh, it kind of started as a new guy call sign that never went away. Uh, there's a there's a pretty good story involving uh, a few of these in the Philippines, uh, and maybe some jam. Not quite sure. Uh, the PG oh. version is if mom and grandma are listening. I just love playing the best music in the ready room. I love jamming out. You love jamming. That's that's my no one else that's my backup but mom story. and grandma are gonna believe that. By yeah, the way, <laughs> I know they still do it for some reason. Okay. They haven't heard the. the well, at uh, least you came up with something. I've had a couple like no, I don't want to answer that. Like, yeah. oh, come on. Well, you gotta have a backup. People love call signs. Yeah, you, you know? gotta have a backup. Yeah. For sure. <laughs> All right. Well, of the million things I didn't ask you about LSOs, this is like the you know the sizzle reel part now. Sure. Where you get to like, what did I not ask you? What's what's important about LSOs or landing on the boat that uh, is kind of a takeaway for today? Gosh, I think I think we have to remember that even with all of the technology that improves our ability to land, you know, we could talk about the stats and we love looking. You know, Navy loves PowerPoints and Excel spreadsheets, and it all looks good on paper, right? Um, but even with all of that, the boat will forever be the great equalizer. And the old gray lady, as we call her, she'll humble you in a heartbeat. So that's why we still have a job. That's why I still take this job very passionately. I love training. I love being out there on the roof with everyone watching Jets land, training the further generations. And instilling that into tailhook aviation is something that will never go away as long as we got hooks on jets and people inside of them. So jam boy out on that one. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, that's as good as it gets. Assuming uh, we don't decide to not use any of this because, you know, you're just too colorful. No, that, uh, <laughs> but assuming this is going to come out, I'm going to on air give you one of these. I don't think I've done for everybody else, but uh, it's a fighter pilot podcast patch. No way. Guest. Oh. Uh, limited edition. I should put the number on here, but yeah. that's going to be a little token for you. I know you'll wear it probably you, sir. somewhere on a flight seat or a jacket. Yeah. But, uh, I'll just put guest number 69 on there in true paddles fast. <laughs> <laughs> and then slam it on the Winnebago, as we call it. Fantastic. That's awesome. Thanks, Joe. This You're is welcome. Awesome. Well, Jambo, you were a great sport. I really enjoyed this. So uh, thanks for coming on the Fighter Pilot Podcast. Yeah, thank you for the opportunity. And see you all later.
Hey, thanks for watching this episode of the Fighter Pilot Podcast. I hope you enjoyed it and learned something new. I sure do every time. Now, in case we had some jargon there you didn't understand, go on over to fighterpilotpodcast.com where we have a glossary as well as musings, which are just our blogs and some cool merchandise that you can check out as well. So we'll see you next time here on the Fighter Pilot Podcast. So long. <laughs>